So good evening. I'd like to call regular council meeting 2021-01 to order. Reverend Richard Spellman will give the invocation and Councilman Donnie Felix will provide the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. Would someone please assist Reverend Spellman? in a way that deserves an applause just getting here. <laughs> now, you. I want to know, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Normally, yes, sir. when I get in, in this type of situation with these, these masks on, I can't hear people, and they always sit me in a chair uh, that I'm not close to a speaker or, or of some sort. And uh, it, it is a joy to, to be here and we're glad to welcome you to this section of uh, Palm Bay because I live not too far from here. It used to be that I could ride my bicycle here with no problem. Uh, don't have a bicycle, I can't ride much anymore. So the Lord has been good to all of us. And so as we bow our heads in prayer, in just a moment I want you to do some singing. If you don't know it, you do your best and I'll do my best. And we, we may come out on different keys, but we'll sing the same song. If we get the, we'll get the words, and they will have meaning to us. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, you who have made each of us, you've made us in your image. In some way or another, we get scattered around, and we think we're, some people are better than others. That's really not true. We may be able to deliver some, certain things that we say we can do, but... We must also recognize that every person is important in your sight, yes. and we're, we're, you've given yourself to us. And you, as you open the book of, of the Old Testament, you read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void. There was nothing there, and God gave us what we have. And you see all that he gave, and you just read chapter one. I really want to give everybody a homework at, at, at this point because if you know God and you know how he works then you'll be able to respond and you'll find life and you'll find it abundantly even when people turn against you and don't go the way that you'd like them to. So help us to keep the mind and the heart there as we move on in this. And so in America uh, there's a song let, let's sing together, God Bless America. Then we'll, i have a little more after that. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairie to the ocean white with foam god bless america our home sweet home once more god bless america my home sweet home father we do we know that you're blessing us may we be a blessing to you and we think we know our our whole nation is in trouble and we need to clear th things up without, without the battles that we're having. And, so, and it's hard to figure out what people want done. But you know what you want done. So that means we must turn to you. We must do our homework again and read the scriptures. Because you speak to us through the scriptures. That's not the only place. But here we get the general guidelines of what you want done in the world in which we live. Because we discover that you reveal to, you, uh, to us that we are the same, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have all have something to give, and we're here tonight to do just that. And we pray your blessing upon all the folks here, and certainly those folks caught in the struggle up in Washington, 
We pray for them that the healing might take place. Where, where, where people need to give, it's hard to figure out there, but we know that you'll give us the guidance that we need if we'll but pay attention and bow down to you and, and, and fall in line to do the things which will bring honor and glory first to you, then to others, and finally to us. And now, Father, as we thank you uh, come to this, this meeting here, we pray your blessing upon the new council folks. They've come in there, and I must admit to myself, to you, oh, oh God, I can't recognize these people. Uh, and it's almost like I've come into a new group altogether because I don't know them there. But we, we will, the more we meet together, the more we try to, to do your will and pay attention first to you and learn to love you, then we'll find life and we'll find it abundantly. That's what you've promised, and we'll find it there. So let your blessing be upon us, on our council folks, and the good work that needs to be done by those who back it up, with the, the workers here, and, and all the people here have come to honor you. May you be honored in what we do here. May we listen to you. Yes, Lord. Help us to slow down, catch up with what we need to know, and do and be while we're here in this, this great meeting together. You're a great and wonderful God, and we must honor you. So our homework is get reading the scriptures, and we'll find out what God wants to do, wants done, and we'll, he'll give us the strength to do what he wants us to do. Each of us have a responsibility. We just can't say that the city must do this because we are part of the city. And help us to recognize that we are a part of the city. We're an important part. And we make it less important when we try to stay back and we, we can spend a lot of time watching the TV, but we never get much accomplished there uh, other than order a new, a new TV or something like that. So God, help us to be your servants today, tomorrow, and always while we're here because we want Palm Bay to be a shining lot, light on, on this area, and people find hope and joy and peace. And may we remember that, that, that the gospel hymn, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We need to keep that in mind because that's what's true. You created each, and so may we learn to honor you and be your servants and the servant of all. There, there, I'm sure there's much more that we could say in recognition of the people who've run for this office and they have it, and now they wonder sometimes what they have because it can be tough. But help them to hang in there and to, to, to make the witness that you want made so that Palm Bay can be a great city. But then we want you to be honored by what we do and say. And we can say God has made this and we're, we're so... We're seeking to serve God in his will and way. There's much more that can be said. And believe you me, I'm getting to the place where I can say more, but I won't do it now. So bless us and guide us and use us for your glory. You're a great and wonderful God, and we love you through your son, Jesus. And by the way, the eight days of Christmas now will end tomorrow. So we can still celebrate Christmas. People can understand Christmas and the faith with the coming of a baby. But about three, three months from now, when we get to the time of the crucifixion, we discover people don't gather. Get, what's this got to do? Do we, we have to go through all this? What Jesus had to go through, some of us will have to do that or come close to it. So may we be your servants and the servants of all. And may Jesus be served at all times. I pray in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Well, you better just take me on to the back seat, and I'll, I'll make my exit. Thank you for your kindness and your courtesy. And if you can pick up my, my, you got my Bible? Gotcha. Yep. Oh, now, how many of you brought your Bible? <laughs> got it. It's, it's good. You see here, if I can get turned around, I, I can probably walk a little bit. There you go, sir. But you kept me uh, seated.
Councilman Felix. Or under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice for all. Wrong. Ms. Leffler, roll call, please. Present. Here. Councilman Bailey. Here. Councilman Foster. Here. Councilman Felix. Here. Ms. Sherman. Here. Ms. Smith. Here. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Make the announcements, please. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. We have one vacancy on the Business Improvement District Board, represents bank or financial institution position. One vacancy on the Youth Advisory Board, represents at-large student member position. Anyone wishing to serve on these boards can apply online at palmbayflorida.org or contact the City Clerk's Office at 321-952-3414. Ms. Sherman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have the following changes to the agenda to announce. Item seven under public hearings. The resolution for concept developments conditional use request has been revised to include the full legal description of the property. Also added is discussion of the position of city manager added by Councilman Foster as item number nine under new business. Thank you. Ms. Smith. Any no, revisions? Sir. No, sir. Deputy Mayor, are there any public comments? No, sir. Councilor, any items from the agenda or the consent agenda? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the consent agenda with the revision of public hearing item number seven and with the addition of new business item number nine. Second. Do any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Ms. Smith? Resolution 2020-2021-01. A resolution of the City of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, rescinding resolution 2018-51, which authorized the permanent closure of Waterbury Avenue between Summer Street and Toulon Road, providing for an effective date. Okay, we're up uh, to recognitions and proclamations. Uh, proclamation for Business Partner of the Year, uh, Palm Bay Walmart. I'm gonna call up Alex uh, Delhagen and Sandy Wigley. So, uh, I'll do the Batman style. <laughs> <laughs> Proclamation City of Palm Bay, Florida, Notice and Proclamation of Business Partner of the Year 2020. It is hereby proclaimed by the Mayor of the City of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, that whereas Walmart has supported several City Palm Bay departments with their events and is always willing to donate to any project or request from the city, and whereas Walmart has fully sponsored five movie in the park events and provided DVD copies of movies for most of the movie events. They also provided decorations, food, and drinks for city staff at Independence Day movie event, at an Independence Day movie event, as you were. Whereas Walmart donated countless prizes for the annual golf tournament, including a 70-inch HD TV and a barbecue grill. Whereas Walmart provided all the lights and the tunnel at the Holiday and Life Fest. They also participated in the parade with a large display using two semis plus a snow machine and in inflatable decorations. Whereas Walmart donated a pallet of water for the Christmas extravaganza. Thank you. Whereas Walmart provided a grant 
for the police department's reindeer run event and provided the police department with hand sanitizers, wipes, and Lysol. And whereas Walmart supported the fire department's ladder climb and provided tables for the fire department to sell campaign shirts for fight against breast cancer. And whereas Walmart assisted with the fire department's shop with a firefighter event. Now therefore I, Rob Medina, mayor of the city of Palm Bay, Palm Bay by virtue of the authority of said office, do hereby proclaim that Walmart is the, is the city of Palm Bay's business partner of the year 2020 in witness whereof I have set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Palm Bay to be affixed on this seventh day of January 2021. Congratulations. So not good at this kind of thing, but we'll make it work. So I came here about a year ago, and uh, I always knew of some of the events that Sandy started um, before I was born. Actually, she's been doing she's been doing this a long time. But um, you know, coming here, I think one of the things I wanted to make sure that we continued to sponsor was the city. Um, rather, it was the police department, the fire department, Chief Leslie back there. Um, you know, someone told me once that you know having a business in the city is great but you're only as strong as the community. And I think that uh, really stands tall to me. Um, being able to support the community in any way possible um, really you know, sets heart and uh, stands true to me, um, especially during these Christmas times and the times that we're dealing with now, being able to support like the reindeer run and the, the children and the, uh, the park and anything like that is, is just awesome. And you know, I really appreciate um, receiving that award and I, I do appreciate Sandy. Um, she makes a lot of this happen. She just lets me know, hey, this is what we're doing. I say, okay. <laughs> so, um, but thank you guys again. Thank you, Sandy. Appreciate Sandy, it. Sandy, would you like to say a few words? She would. <laughs> Someone will take the spot right now. Um, I just want to thank you guys for what you guys do um, for the city. You guys know that Walmart's always been a part. You know, we started off on Palm Bay Road in West Melbourne. They made so much business there that we opened the one on Malabar Road. We now... Um, have doubled our um, our revenue. We've doubled our customer service. So we just want to thank you guys for what you guys do for the city. And um, I just appreciate the fact that we can work for a company that allows us to donate to our community. Thank you, guys. Congratulations, man. Hop on. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. I'm Superman, you Batman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we at? Ms. Sherman, presentations. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to actually bring up now to uh, do a presentation uh, Joan Yuncala Brown, who is our Community and Economic Development Director. I've asked her to put together a few slides and provide a, a brief overview of what her. Um, her department does for the city. It's a fairly newly uh, constituted department. We've added some, some divisions over the past year or so. And also some of what she will share with you tonight will tee up for a workshop that we're scheduling with council uh, in February. So, Joan. Thank you. 
Is it better? Okay. I know I have a small voice, so just wanted to make sure it's working. Good evening. Happy New Year. Thank you for allowing me to come present to you all tonight. Um, like Ms. Sherman said, this is a relatively new department. We existed previously as Economic Development and External Affairs. Um, we are now Community and Economic Development. Um, I want to just state, you know, for the record, we have some of my team here. They're fantastic. A lot of them wanted to join to be able to show their support in this department and their support in and council understanding what it is we do. We have a fantastic team. Uh, we have Keely Leggett, Public Information Officer, Britta Kellner, our Special Projects Manager, otherwise known as our Grants Manager. We have Sandra Urban, our Housing Administrator, and Christina Bourne, our Community Information Coordinator. They're part of the team, so on behalf of the department, I'm gonna make a presentation to you about who we are, what we do, and what we're looking to do for the city going forward. So as an introduction, just wanted to give you an overview of the mission statement for the department as a whole, and that mission statement is to foster a vibrant, diversified, and healthy economy with an enhanced quality of life for all residents, providing for a stable tax base, business and employment opportunities and community amenities. And as we get into the presentation, you'll see why that is so broad. So we are a department of 10 full-time employees. Um, I will state that we have actually 11 right now. We have secured a full-time temporary employee from Career Source Brevard that is helping us to administer some of the CARES Act dollars that we've received from the federal government. So we have myself, and I apologize it's a little small, but I'm the director for community and economic development. I lead the, the team of what is essentially three divisions, economic development, housing and community development, and then communications. I'll touch on the, the fourth, so to speak, that we see kind of coming up in the next year or so. Um, I won't read all of the, the titles there, but you'll see we've got a, a small team. We are small, but we are mighty. I'm not going to read all of this to you. This is our code of ordinances. We are chapter 39 in the city's code of ordinances, and it addresses three of the divisions that our department has. And again, there are technically four if we're looking at it, you know, with respect to the grants and legislative component being added. Um, economic development is one key component, housing and community development, communications, and again, that grants management and legislation. So I'll start off with economic development, and the reason I started off with this one is I know that previous council had um, a desire to see more commercial growth in the city of Palm Bay, and the reason for that being to increase our tax base, to, to diversify our tax base so that we can uh, provide more uh, services for the community. So the mission statement that we've developed for economic development division is to enhance the quality of life for all residents by encouraging community redevelopment, private capital investment, and job creation while increasing the tax base of the city. And I just outlined a couple of bullet points that provide an overview of what it is we really do and what tasks and initiatives we do are meant to um, to facilitate for the city, for the community. And that is to enhance and diversify the local tax base through attracting new private capital investment, facilitate new private development and employment opportunities, and we do that by attraction and recruitment of new business and retention expansion of our existing business and industries here in Palm Bay. Foster redevelopment opportunities targeting areas of slum and blight, and we do that through our community redevelopment agency that is housed under the Economic Development Division. Leverage city surplus real estate for favorable development opportunities. We're not looking to just sell the properties we have. We really want to see those properties that we own be developed into something favorable that would give back to the community, whether it's a, a large business that's employing our, our residents, whether it's a type of development that provides an amenity to the community, whether it's a single family home lot that we know will be developed and not just sit vacant, unmowed. So that's the intent there. Promote, the Palm Bay, prom promote Palm Bay as the place to do business by implementing business-friendly practices. And Mayor, you know we recently put out a couple of, we drafted a couple of letters to welcome new businesses to the community. We drafted a letter that um, will go out with the business tax renewals. And the intention of that is to recognize that we have businesses here in the city of Palm Bay. And, you know, we shouldn't be letting them just kind of operate in their own silos. We need to reach out to them, make sure that they know that we appreciate that they're here, that we want to retain them here, and we want to see more of those businesses come into the community. Uh, we also serve as a liaison for businesses and developers to internal and external regulatory agencies. And what that means is 
really we are wanting to ensure that businesses that are coming to the city of Palm Bay are met with a face, a face that is friendly, that is customer service oriented, that welcomes them to the community, and not only welcomes them, but also ensures that whatever hurdles they encounter in doing business or development in the city of Palm Bay, that they have somebody that will help guide them through the process. Whether that's with our building department, whether it's challenges or hurdles with navigating planning and zoning, or whether that's with an outside agency, um, whether, you know, the St. John's River Water Management District or Florida Department of Economic Opportunity when they're looking to expand. And then finally, the coordinating with local resource partners to eliminate impediments to starting or sustaining businesses, industries, and jobs as well. Um, and we do that with part partnering with our local workforce agency, our chamber, and a lot of the other resource partners, is, partners that we have here in the city. That is our way of providing that technical assistance, that guidance to the business to ensure that they can sustain and grow. And, and we, we, we do that with the intention of not to fail them, but to um, help them succeed. The second division in the department is the Housing and Community Development Division. This was previously housed under growth management. In, I believe, the end of 2019, it was moved over to community and economic development, and the intention of that was to bring together a department that serves the city overall, whether it's residents or businesses. So we have the Housing and Community Development Division mission statement, which is to enhance the quality of life for low and moderate income residents by administering housing and community development grant programs that foster stability, self-sufficiency, and create and sustain decent, affordable, decent, safe, and affordable housing. We do that through the state and federal grant programs that we receive through um, SHIP, CDBG, and I'll, I'm going to read the acronyms here in a minute, HOME, NSP, and recently through our CARES dollars. So we have the State Housing Initiative Program, and that program is intended to increase and sustain single-family home ownership. We have programs for down payment assistance. We have programs for um, single-family home rehabilitation and emergency repair for those that are low and moderate income households. The Community Development Block Grant is a community, is a community development efforts that assist low and moderate income residents. The aim is to eliminate slum and blight. And we do this through increasing public services um, to communities, to our residents that are either providing youth programs, providing case management for the homeless. Um, we've got a number of public service agencies that are awarded on an annual basis, allocations through CDBG to provide services to those residents. Under the HOME program, it is intended to encourage affordable housing development, affordable home ownership, similar to our down payment assistance under the SHIP program and provides for tenant-based rental assistance. This is not something that we're currently providing, but it is something that we have been looking to um, integrate into our programs. Neighborhood Stabilization Program addresses abandoned and foreclosed homes while increasing permanent housing opportunities for low and moderate income persons. The Voluntary Home Buyout Program is a new, relatively new program. It is, um, it is a focused program. It's funded through grants that the city obtained through FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and the local match, which is community development block grant disaster recovery. And that is intended to acquire 13 homes on Cimarron Circle who have suffered repetitive loss. And that, that really was a request that came from the community seeking the city's assistance and support in, in identifying how they can get past this repetitive flood loss due to uh, hurricanes. And then finally, one thing that's not on the PowerPoint, but is obviously something that we have, you know, been given and, and tasked with is, is the CARES Act dollars. We have the Coronavirus Relief Fund that we recently just closed. That was CARES Act dollars provided to the city for rent utility mortgage, rent mortgage utility assistance. Uh, we heard that we will probably get another uh, package of funds and we might be able to reopen that program to utilize the remainder of those funds. We haven't heard yet, but we're, we're, we're hoping that we can offer that to the community. Finally, under the CARES Act assistance um, program was the Community Development Block Grant Coronavirus Funds, and that is uh, additional funding allocations and almost about one and a half million dollars to provide public services to those who are facing um, hardship during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Communications Division, the face of the city, our branding arm of the city. Um, they. The communications division is tasked with all of the outward facing, public facing uh, materials and branding and, and telling the world who we are, telling our community who we are. 
Um, and, and their mission statement is to facilitate public engagement and collaboration through dissemination of information to residents, businesses, and stakeholders. And they do that in a variety of ways. They coordinate with the city departments to gather and disseminate information on city-led programs, projects, initiatives, news, events like ribbon cuttings. They distribute timely information to residents on various topics using a variety of outlets to include leveraging our media partners, press releases, e-notifications, the website, social media, print media, digital marketing, cable and news radio. The team is responsible for developing and managing the city's contact for content for all public facing materials as well as mediums and coordinates with departments to prepare public advisories and responds to media inquiries. They're also responsible for strategic marketing of the city as a destination for permanent residents, businesses, and visitors. And then I will say during COVID-19, the team of four, which is our public information officer, our community information coordinator, our web administrator, and our technical editor, they were working tirelessly to make sure that every ounce of news that came out about COVID, every update that came out about COVID was hitting the website, Facebook, uh, press releases, whatever we could to do, whatever we could do to get that information out to the residents and businesses. Our public information officer, Keely Leggett, provided me with a couple of stats that I thought were pretty interesting, so I'm gonna share them just briefly with you, and I'll just hit the key ones. We have seven means for reaching our residents and businesses, our community, and that's through social media, push notifications, and email, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Nextdoor, Constant Contact, e-notifications, and Everbridge. The city of Palm Bay has over 12,000 followers on Facebook. The police department has over 23,000 followers on Facebook. Nextdoor has over 19 total 19,000 total members. The city has sent over nearly 8,000, um, I'm sorry, has nearly 8,000 subscribers and has sent nearly a quarter of a million notifications in the last six months. So it's pretty impressive what the team is, is able to do. And then finally, and, that, and, and not last but not least, our grants and legislative, what we call the Office of Grants Management or Grants Management Office. Britta Kellner joined our team just a few short months ago. She was tasked with um, providing um, assistance for grant application, identifying grant opportunities, and the intent of that really is to lessen the burden on the general fund. So the grant writing and legislative position was intended to seek and apply for state and federal grant opportunities, identify legislative priorities such as critical infrastructure projects, water quality projects, and seek state and federal assistance following declared disasters as well. Um, this role is also required to ensure that, that, our, that there is compliance with the program. So coordinating with those departments who have received the grant awards to ensure that we are complying with all of the requirements of that state or federal grant. And finally, coordinates with the city state lobbying firm. So for instance, this evening we had the Brevard legislative delegation meeting and we worked with our uh, state lobbying firm, Sunrise Consulting Group, identified key priorities to present to the legislators and had that presentation this evening. One thing that we do that's not often told is emergency assistance, uh, emergency preparedness and assistance. And we talked a bit about what we're doing with COVID. Um, typically when we talk about this, we're talking about hurricanes. That's not the case right now. Right now it's COVID-19. And the way we do that is coordination with our uh, County Emergency uh, Operations Center, our Brevard County Emergency Management Team, the Florida Department of Health, and all the other um, local resource partners that are trying to um, you know, help the community during, during this, this particular emergency. Our department is responsible for um, overseeing four boards. We have the Bayfront Community Redevelopment Agency that uh, sunsets in 2024. The Business Improvement District, which is relatively new, and that is intended to fund business development, infrastructure, and jobs. The Community Development Advisory Board, which serves as the city's affordable housing advisory committee, and that really is truly intended to guide how we use the state and federal uh, grant programs. And uh, last but not least, the recently, um, uh, the uh, Sustainability Board. So looking at creating a sustainability action plan for the city. This slide is a little bit outdated. 
Um, it shows, I think, eight funds. We technically, I think, have about 10 now. Um, a lot of these funds are grant funds. So you'll see that we mention the community development <coughs> block grant, home grant, ship grant. Those are individual funds as they need to be, but those are nine plus funds that this, this department manages and oversees to ensure compliance with the programs. And that is all. Any questions? Council, any questions? Deputy Mayor Johnson. Um, I'm just a few comments and a, and a question as well. Um, thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Joan, and everybody who attended from your department. Um, for those in the audience that may not realize that this department might be small, but it's definitely one of the most impor important departments here in the city. Um, you, like, you, you see us full uh, five male council, but these women are getting the job done. Um, so like starting with economic development, you know, increasing our economic development not only brings more tax base to spread across the other departments, but also helps us out in regards to lowering our millage rate so we can compete with cities like Melbourne, West Melbourne, Titusville that have a higher business um, percentage than us. Housing and community development. I've been in, in and out of the second building and these women are hard, hard working and trying to help these citizens. And we have all, these, all of our citizens in the city of Palm Bay and a lot of them are hurting and need assistance with the CARES dollars. They're working diligently. Yes, some of them are, there's some hiccups on the way. This might have not been signed. This page might have been skipped, but I've seen them in action and they're patient and they're working diligently with all these um, residents. And communication, Keely and Christina, I appreciate y'all because what better way to bring transparency than to make sure you provide as much information as possible. And that goes also to 142 Productions, which is out here right now and um, the Palm Bay Police Department. And then last but not least, grants, saving dollars. Councilman Bailey's probably licking his chops on that one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but saving dollars, you, you can't beat it. So the only question I have, I, I know you just added another position, but m this mostly is for economic development and housing and community development. Do you feel with the staff you have, you're, you're good, good enough? Or do you think you can do more with more assistance or more staffing or in regards to, you know? So if you look at the org chart, I don't know if my mic's working, but um, the org chart shows two divisions predominantly, um, public information, communications, and housing. Housing always needs more assistance. We have so many programs, so much money, so many applicants that are coming in the door on a day-to-day -day basis, we really can't keep up with it. Um, and if we, if we don't get one more position, at least I think there, there's going to be some struggle along the way. Um, economic development, it's myself, and we're working towards getting Danielle's promotion as economic development assistant. Um, right now it's hard to reach out to the business community when we're so inundated with the CARES dollars and the housing program funds and trying to get everything you know, maintained in compliance. I'm one person, Danielle is one half person. Uh, she's, her her um, responsibilities are split between admin responsibilities and, and she's been taking on a lot of economic development stuff to assist me along the way. Um, so there is another position needed. Um, and down, down the road, we're looking at another grants position. If we continue to apply for grants, we may need some assistance with that. Um, I know that Keeley has expressed assistance with content, building content and getting it out fast enough because you know she might be working on a number of press releases and then you know something happens. Um, the chamber floods, a fire explosion happens. And that takes her away from being able to build that content. So we are looking at a need for at least four positions. I'm um, in the short term too, but I would say we're small, we're mighty. We come to work every day saying, we've got this can-do attitude. We're gonna do everything we can with what we have. Um, but if I'm being honest, absolutely, we need more positions. Thank you. Councilman Foster. Thank you too. Thank you, Mayor. Um, what, what is your goal to, I'm very interested in uh, attracting more commercial business and manufacture business to Palm Bay. Do you have a plan or what is your goal? So right now what we're doing is we are working um, with our resource partners. So the Economic Development Commission is um, tasked from the state to receive all those state leads for the, for the larger employers, so the manufacturing companies. 
um, for the larger engineering firms like like Harris, for example. And we rely on them to capture those leads and reach out to the city and tell us, you know, we're, we've got somebody that's looking for 100,000 square feet and they want to bring, you know, 100, 100 jobs at, you know, $48,000 average salary. And when we establish that relationship, it allows us to get a bite of that pie. And we actually have a meeting coming up with the EDC to talk about what we have available in terms of land, what we want to do, and to talk about the presentation that we're about to make to council on February 11th for incentives and in inducements. That is going to be an integral, par integral part of how we can attract more business to the city. And I, I know some, some people believe we don't need to provide incentives. To an extent, I do think we can stand to look at a couple of programs. It doesn't have to be monetary, um, but I want to revisit this discussion on bringing forth incentives or inducements to the business community to attract large employers, jobs, and, and decent wages. Okay, thank you. Councilman Fields, anything? I'd just like to uh, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for what you guys do. So I'd like to echo what both uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson and, and Councilman Foster said. Uh, our uh, commercial base, uh, that is the focus of, of this council, and that's what I'm hearing. Uh, and anything we can do to increase that, your meetings with the EDC, uh, the workshop that's ensuing, uh, we're really excited about these opportunities. Uh, you're absolutely right. We need to discuss those incentives, open that up, have a discussion, and see where the chips fall. Um, another issue that I think uh, I want to echo is your team is just outstanding. You were small and mighty, but I've been working closely, uh, especially with Keely and, and uh, Christina. And what an outstanding team you have. And, and uh, what a great foundation to continue to build on that. So I'm sure we'll be discussing that in the near future as we progress with our workshop our budget workshop in particular as well, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see how we, we handle that in the future. But uh, I want to commend you. I want to echo Council's support of, of what you've accomplished. So thank you. Thank you. Couldn't do it without the team. Deputy Mayor Johnson, any public uh, comment? Pastor Ken Delgado. Ken Delgado, Palm Bay, 154 Angelo Road. Good to see everybody here. Uh, great job, Reverend Spellman. Uh, today was wonderful. And I'm just here because I guess I did my homework and read part of the Bible, and I just thought I'd share this uh, in reference to the uh, city of Palm Bay, and, and I'm Palm Bay proud. I just want to say I'm Palm Bay proud. Hoorah. It's, I was reading Isaiah 58, 6, and he talks about fasting, although maybe not everybody uh, does that, uh, but we could just say one way of living. He says, free those who are wrongly imprisoned, lighten the burden of those who work for you, let the oppressed go free, remove the chains that bind people, share your food with the hungry, give shelter to the homeless, Give clothes to those who need them, and do not hide from relatives who need your help. And then there's a promise. It says, then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. I would just say, boy, if we grabbed hold of this type of living, and maybe because now I'm hitting 67, I'm becoming more like Spellman and just thinking, you know, retrospectively and... And uh, maybe I could look to be like him when I grow up. Uh, but just if we were to think about this, and uh, as we uh, continue with Palm Bay, and certainly we just heard an example here as they help those people who are in need, what a great way to run a city. And may God continue to bless you all as you lead us forward in this great city called Palm Bay. Just wanted to share that thought with you all. Thank Have you. Have a great New Year. It's on. It's on. We're entering uh, the public hearings uh, portion of the agenda. Ms. Smith? Ordinance, Ordinance 2020-58, an 
ordinance of the city of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, amending the code of ordinances, Title 17, Land Development Code, Chapter 170, Construction Codes and Regulations, Subchapter, Building Code, by eliminating the requirement for a building permit for accessory structures, 120 square feet or less, in residential districts associated with single family dwellings, and revising provisions contained therein, providing for the repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for inclusion in the City of Palm Bay Code of Ordinances, providing for a severability clause, providing for an effective date. I'd like to open up the public hearing and uh, turn it over to Councilman Bailey. Yeah, <clears throat> one second. Hey, Mayor, I don't want to add too much to it. Um, you know, obviously, I appreciate council support last time and staff for working so hard and diligently and coming up with a solution that was universally accepted uh, throughout the building industry and building code and for staff for backing it um, and, and P&Z as well. So anyhow, I just you know for me, the main topic is trying to make sure that government doesn't have any unnecessary regulations or slow down the work of uh, individuals or businesses uh, who want to move forward. And I would just add one thing. One of the things that was on the consent agenda was regarding the building department. Um, we see that there's been, you know, there's been a great need for uh, plans reviewers, inspections, things of that nature to be done. Um, whenever I went through a pretty big analysis last year, you know, Ms. Sherman, uh, Mr. Bradley, and it was right when um, uh, Mr. Uh, when Valentino came, came on board um, uh, last summer, but we were paying about 78, uh, I think it was 78 or 79 bucks uh, an hour is what we found for the outside, which is quite higher than what we're paying on the inside. And that was also one of the ideas is trying, like you said, you know, Deputy Mayor hits it right on the head, uh, find ways maybe we could even shave back some of our costs because if we're having to pay 39, I think it was about, they could probably do two of those in an hour of these sheds an hour. You know, that's you know, about 39 bucks a piece, somewhere around there. Um, that we're shaving off too. So I think there's a fiscal impact as well. But I think the biggest thing is just trying to save homeowners uh, and businesses time. I'd like to open this up. Uh, anyone wants to, wishes to speak for or against this item? Seeing none, I'm closing the public hearing. And uh, Council, I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, make a motion. Oops, sorry. Mayor, I make a motion to approve Ordinance 2020-58 for final reading. Is there a second? Second. You know, I'd like to comment, uh, Councilman Bailey, you, you brought this forth, and, and I'm really proud of this ordinance. I'm really proud of the hard work that, that Council has uh, been led by your leadership, and I also want to thank staff for putting this together. So thank you very much. Any further discussion? Hearing none? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes Aye. unanimously. Oh, mayor. I, mayor. Oh, as you were. Yeah. I, Councilman I just, Felix. Just for the record, uh, I just want to maintain my, uh, my uh, position on that. Um, you know, the safety aspect is very important to me. So I maintain my, uh, my, my position as a nay vote. Copy that, sir. Passes four to one. Item two, Ms. Smith. Ordinance 2020-85. An ordinance of the City of Palm Bay, Bavaria County, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances, Title III, Administration, Chapter 39, Community and Economic Development, by including additional provisions for the Economic Development Division, and adding in the Business Improvement District as a departmental division, providing for the repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for inclusion in the City of Palm Bay Code of Ordinances, providing for a severability clause, providing for an effective date. I'd like to open the, the public hearing, Ms. Sherman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is the um, second uh, final reading for this particular ordinance. These are very minor changes to reflect the current responsibilities of the Community and Economic Development Department. Uh, it includes the update to reflect that they are responsible for the Business Improvement District as well as the um, uh, Sustainability Board. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak for or against this item? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Council, what is your pleasure? Motion to approve ordinance 2020-85, final reading. Second. Second by Councilman Foster. Any discussion? 
I'm calling it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number three, Ms. Smith. Ordinance 2020-86, an ordinance of the city of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, amending the code of ordinances, Title IX, General Regulations, Chapter 92, Noise, by modifying definitions contained therein, providing for the repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for inclusion in the city of Palm Bay code of ordinances, providing for a severability clause, providing for effective date. I'd like to open the public hearing. Ms. Sherman? Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is also a final reading for this ordinance. Uh, these are some uh, minor updates to definitions in this uh, Chapter 92, which relates to noise. Um, specifically, they were corrections to make it clear, to clarify and make it clear what the definition of a weekday versus a weekend would be, and we're happy to answer any questions. Is there anyone in the audience that wish wishes to speak for or against this item? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is closed. Council, what is your pleasure? Make a motion to approve Ordinance 2020-86, final reading. Second. Second by Deputy Mayor Johnson. Any further discussion? Call in the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number four, Ms. Smith. Ordinance 2020-87. An ordinance of the City of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, amending the Code of ordinances, ordinances, Title 17, Land Development Code, Chapter 185, Zoning Code, Subchapter, District Regulations, by modifying front yard building setbacks and parking areas, and reducing the minimum side corner building setback in RC, Restricted Commercial District Zoning, providing for the repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith, providing for inclusion in the City of Palm Bay Code of Ordinances, providing for a severability clause, providing for an effective date. I'd like to open the public hearing and defer to Councilman Bailey. Yeah, Mayor, this is a further trying to remove regulatory roadblocks for commercial development on Malabar. Uh, I think it was pretty common sense into bringing the district into a line with other commercial and uh, districts that are up and down Malabar. Um, and, and hopefully we can get some good development and those areas have been vacant for, you know, since before I was here. Copy that. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak for or against this item? Step forward. Thank you. Bill Batten, 586 Ocean Spray Street Southwest. I had a couple of items on this one I'd like to discuss. Hopefully that something like this will be corrected when we get the new zoning of the city worked out and we go through the planning and zoning of all of that. But the other one is, when we start shortening the distance at the, or the setback, that means that's, that land is used. And it'll make it very impossible, or very hard, not impossible, that for some reason if we have to start widening this road more than what we're already predicting, that we've cut into that buffer that was available to either side of the road, which I can see, I mean, maybe not in my lifetime, but I can see it shortly within thereafter, the Malabar Road will be widened even again, just by the size and the way the city of Palm Bay has grown. It's just, you, you, we're just shy of Orlando in, in the land mass, and you see what's gonna to happen to us. So that's gonna be a problem eventually. So when you, make, when you start cutting away what buffer you have, Eventually, you have no buffer to take, so then you have to buy the entire business in order to expand the road. That's one thing. The other thing that I'm watching with this one, it'll come into play more with item number seven, is the fact that when you start putting bus businesses closer to the road, that the setback causes more of a traffic problem also. I understand the overall objective. You want the developers to cut and business to come in and make use of facilities within the city. But I can see a negative side by when you start shortening that buffer of land mass. It's not like there's a severe shortage of land in the city of Palm Bay. It's just, well, we just need a little bit more closer to the road. That's, there's, that's not gonna solve the problem when you eventually run out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Sherman? 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, the majority of these uh, restricted commercial um, properties that remain undeveloped are in the portion of Malabar that is uh, essentially west of the Emerson connection and um, kind of ends around the Minton area. Um, we do have additional right of way in that area for the future uh, uh, expansion of that portion of the road to match the existing portion that is, you know, closer to 95. Um, but beyond that, um, the entire roadway of Malabar from basically Minton to 95 and beyond, they're, they're with the commercial corridor as it is, there's not any really any significant space available to do more widening than what's already there, you know, up against 95, just for informational purposes. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak for or against this item? Seeing or hearing none, I'm closing the public hearing. Council, what is your pleasure? Make a motion to approve ordinance 2020-87, final reading. Second. Second yeah. by Councilman Felix. Any discussion? Yeah, Mayor, if, if I may add, yeah, I, I appreciate what uh, Mr. Batten was saying. Um, I, I think Ms. Sherman for explaining that a little bit. I think staff did address that in our, our uh, conversations as well, that that was gonna be addressed, that we do have that uh, right away set aside. And, and biggest thing is to remember, this brings it into compliance or I shouldn't say compliance, into, um, into the same setback requirements for other commercials along the same corridor. So it makes it uniform, is what I should be saying. Um, my final comment I want to add on it is that, you know, as far as we just had an economic development presentation, I think looking for these type of things, and I'm hoping that you no know, Joan and her department engages. Uh, Mr. Batten alluded to the uh, city's comprehensive plan review, which we are doing a comprehensive review of that uh, right now. We're in the process, and, you know, probably go through next year. That we look at ways that we can, you know, make the code work for both our citizens and our businesses to maximize our commercial uh, investment and our also, you know, the commercial investment brings you no know, opportunities for our people to shop and and have entertainment and other things within the city instead of leaving the city. And I think that ultimately that's a long-term goal is to be a self-sustaining uh, city. As far as you no, know, we we are a very large landmass. We have a significant population. We need to be. Uh, living, working, no, we should need, we're living here, we need to be working and playing here as well. So that's, uh, I'm hoping that, you know, Joan and city manager's office and, well, no, obviously I know they're going to be working with our, uh, with our other departments and you know, blood by growth um, to make sure that we find ways to maximize items like this, which are no cost items. Any further discussion, council? Seeing none, I'm calling the item. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Ms. Smith. The following items are quasi-judicial in nature. Public hearings agenda items number five, six, and seven. Any person who wishes to testify on such a matter must sign a speaker card which contains a sworn oath to tell the truth. Any speaker may be subject to cross-examination by the council or any other interested party. Attorneys who are appearing on behalf of a party and not providing testimonial evidence are not considered witnesses and need not be sworn. Any individual addressing the council must state his or her name and confirm that a speaker card has been signed. Council should disclose any ex parte communication by disclosing the subject matter of the communication and the identity of the person, group, or entity with whom the communication took place. The order of this proceeding will be as follows. First, the applicant will make his presentation followed by staff comments, followed by any other interested party or other person. The applicant will then be allowed concluding remarks. The hearing will then be closed and no additional testimony or argument will be allowed. The council will then deliberate in public. At the end of deliberation, a council member will make a motion on the application to bring the matter to a vote. Every council member is then free to vote in favor or against the motion. Ordinance 2021-01, an ordinance of the City of Palm Bay, Var County, Florida, amending the zoning ordinance of the City of Palm Bay by changing the zoning of property from IU, Institutional Use District, to RS2, Single Family Residential District, which property is located southwest of and adjacent to Zanzibar Road in the vicinity south of Waco Boulevard and east of Melbourne Tillman Water Control District Canal 42R-1, and legally described herein, providing for a change of the zoning map 
providing for an effective date. At this time, I'm deferring to Ms. Sherman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I will we'll defer staff comments after the applicant uh, presents their case. Say again, ma'am. We'll, uh, we'll defer staff comments until after the applicant presents her case. At this time, I'm opening the public hearing. Applicant, please step forward. Hello, Council. Uh, my name is Sam Ginto, my wife, Michelle. Uh, we, we reside at 1061 Zambrana Street, southeast, uh, also in Palm Bay, uh, not, too, not too far away from where the uh, plot of land that's under discussion is being asked to be rezoned. We have been residents of Palm Bay since 2017, and we're, consider we're making uh, Palm Bay our permanent home. We are in the, excuse me, we are in the process of um, building a new home, and we acquired this land. Uh, I just want to say that I do appreciate the planning and zoning uh, support in, in reviewing our request and just the fact that the City Council is entertaining it and the fact that they've um, rec excuse me, rec recommended the rezoning of, uh, of the parcel. So thank you very much and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Does staff have any comments? Uh, no, at this time, we are comfortable with this uh, case. Uh, staff recommended approval, and Planning and Zoning Board um, approved it unanimously. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak or for or against this, uh, this item? Seeing and hearing none, I'm closing the public hearing, and I'm asking for a motion from Council. Make a motion to approve Ordinance 2021-02 for... I'm sorry, I apologize, 2021-01 for first reading. Second. Any further discussion, Council? Seeing and hearing none, I'm calling for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Ms. Smith, item six. Ordinance 2021-02, an ordinance of the City of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, approving a final development plan to be known as Gardens of Waterstone Phase 1 PUD and PUD Plan Unit Development Zoning. This property is located west of and adjacent to Maraloma Boulevard in the vicinity south of Melbourne Tillman Water Control District Canal 38 and legally described herein, providing for a commencement period, providing for an effective date. Ms. Sherman? Um, as in the past hearing, um, I will defer staff comments until after the applicant presents their case. Applicant, please step forward. Hiding oh, way in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jake Wise, civil engineer for the project. Business address is 2651 West O'Galley Boulevard in uh, Melbourne. Uh, I'll give a, just a real brief history um, since we have some uh, uh, relatively newer council members. This project has been uh, in the works since 2004 when it was annexed into the city of Palm Bay. Um, it is part of an already approved master plan. The project uh, Waterstone in conjunction with Cypress Bay, which is uh, Cypress Bay is on the east side of Babcock Street. Waterstone is on the west side of Babcock Street. And all of this is right at the intersection of the new St. John's Heritage Parkway and um, Babcock Street. So we're excited because we have multiple different projects all going on at once. And as the residential uh, component of these projects move forward, the commercial is, will closely fall right behind. And uh, we've had more neighborhood meetings than I can remember. Um, and the uh, residents that are already there um, I have been just over and over again very supportive for the most part, hoping that that commercial will be there soon. And uh, we do have some very positive uh, momentum with the commercial part of uh, these projects as well. So just as a quick um, 
uh, overview, Waterstone itself is 740 acres. Cypress Bay East, we call it, on the east side of Babcock, as I mentioned, is 280 acres. Um, we have, between the two of them, about 186 acres of commercial. Um, and uh, we are allowed up to almost 2,600 residential units in Waterstone alone. Uh, 395 lots are under construction on Cypress Bay. We're, um, there, we're just doing the final closeouts on that right now. So we're really starting to see this uh, whole master planned area coming to fruition. So for um, this project, uh, we have 45 acres. Um, it's the first phase of the gardens. We have two more phases coming. Uh, we have between the projects and also the courtyards, which you guys recently approved and is under construction as well, another residential subdivision, a great uh, diversity of different lot sizes. And um, we're trying to make sure that we have uh, all different types of uh, homes available. Uh, so these are uh, projects that are all being done by different developers. They're not all the same. It's not just one. Um, it's, it's a great mix. So for this whole region, it's a, it's a significant improvement. Um, with that being said, this specific project um, has on 45 acres, 154 units. Um, we're looking at 40 foot by 125 foot deep lots. Uh, it has a tremendous amount of um, uh, neighborhood park, uh, walking trails, recreation open space areas. Um, we have much lower density than what we're allowed for not just this project itself, but for the overall, because we have a lot of open space, preservation, um, a lot of amenities that are part of it. Uh, we're extending water and sewer, both city, uh, for the city as part of this project. Um, and we're going to do a gated neighborhood. The roads will all be built to city standards, but they'll be privately maintained, so they won't be something that the city has to um, uh, have to maintain or worry about at all. Uh, with that being said, be happy to answer any questions council may have. Um, Planning and Zoning Board recommended unanimous approval. Staff recommended approval for it. And if there are any public comments, we appreciate a chance to respond to them. Ms. Sherman? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask our Growth Management Director, Larry Bradley, to come up and uh, just read into the record the um, staff requirements, uh, conditions for this moving forward. Uh, good evening, Larry Bradley, Growth Management. Um, so this was, as was noted, unanimously approved by Planning and Zoning and recommended for approval by uh, staff. In the staff report, uh, we take you through the different aspects of the application. Um, on the last page, we have the conditions. Um, they must come in for administrative approval with full engineer drawings, uh, including architectural uh, drawings and drawings showing the amenities and the walking trails. And then there's a, a section of technical comments generated by um, Public Works, Brevard County, and Utilities Department, which will all be part of an administrative review, which will occur after um, it goes through council. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So if I may, we have already submitted uh, complete construction drawings, um, and uh, we think we've already um, taken care of those comments, but that's part of the administrative review. We'll go back and forth with comments until we've uh, resolved all of the staff's concerns. And I can tell you, they hold our feet to the fire, so they will make sure we comply. And that is not this, just this project, it's every project we do. Well, thank you, Mr. Wise. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask the public, anyone wishes to speak for or against this item? Any cards? Seeing and hearing none, I'm closing the public hearing and I'm asking council for a motion. Motion to approve ordinance 2021-02 with staff's recommendations A through C. 
Uh, first reading. Any discussion, Council? Second. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'm calling it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Ms. Smith, item number seven. Resolution 2021-02, a resolution of the City of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, granting a conditional use to allow a retail store occupying more than 5,000 square feet of gross floor area in NC, Neighborhood Commercial District Zoning, which property is located northwest of and adjacent to DeGroote Road in the vicinity south of Sexton Road and legally described herein, granting the use as a conditional use and providing conditions herein, providing for a commencement period providing for an effective date. Ms. Sherman. Thank you, Mayor. I'll have, um, after the applicant presents their case, I'll have Mr. Bradley come up once again. Thank you. I'd like to open the public hearing and have the applicant step forward, please. Thank you. Council, Jack Spira, 5205 Babcock Street. I just want to say before I go into my presentation, this is sort of old home week for me. About 40 years ago, there was a group of uh, uh, residents in Palm Bay, and at 5 in the morning, we would go and play racquetball uh, in, in this facility. Uh, and with me at that time uh, was Melton Broom, who ultimately became mayor, uh, Robin Fisher, who ultimately became a city councilman here, and councilman in Titusville and a county commissioner. Uh, and so coming here, this is the first time in many, many years I've been here. And coincidentally, the, uh, the street that this property is on is on DeGroote Road. Of course, Frank DeGroote was the mayor of Palm Bay, yes. so it, uh, it's really nostalgic uh, to that extent. Uh, certainly, this is a request for conditional use approval to increase the maximum building square footage uh, on a site on an NC neighborhood commercial district uh, from 5,000 square feet to 10,400 square feet. The property is on a 1.81 acre parcel. As indicated, uh, it's on the north side of, of DeGroote Road near Sexton Road Southwest. Existing zoning does allow 5,000 square feet commercial building to be put on here as a permitted use. Uh, what I'd like to do, there is a staff report uh, that you've prov been provided. I want to clarify the staff report. Uh, that seems to indicate there's R2 single family on all sides. I want to go through what's adjacent to this property. On the north, uh, north of this property, there's a single family zoning. It's vacant. That's immediately behind the property. To the east is NC neighborhood commercial, 1.1 acres, vacant to this is property. South of this parcel across from DeGroote is NC commercial institutional zoning. That's a 2.81 acre parcel. That is an FPNL facility. Uh, there's approximately an acre of paved area there. They have 11,000 square feet of paved walls, uh, and they use that for, uh, I guess, trucking or whatever they, they, they do over there. Uh, to west of this parcel, uh, there's a 100-foot wide FPNL easement, power line easement. So really the proximity between this property and any adjacent properties is, is very minimal. Uh, the staff report states that all items required under the code 185.07 of the Palm Bay Code have been met. Uh, request that the staff report be incorporated into this presentation. Also, the applicant agrees to comply with the staff recommendations within its report. Uh, give you some background on this case. This case was heard by the Planning and Zoning Board, and it was denied by 3-2. Uh, and, and the way that that denial came apart, came uh, into play, after the staff report was read and the presentation was made, uh, there was one resident voice and objection. At that point, there were no other comments. The public hearing was closed, and the issue was brought, brought back before the board. At that time, the chairman on his own, without any stated basis, voiced his opinion that the project would generate too much traffic and stated he would vote to deny the request. Uh, the applicant at that point was unable to respond to any issues dealing with traffic because the, tra because the public hearing had been closed and there's no opportunity to raise that issue and that resulted in a three to two vote for denial. I'll point out that the staff report specifically requires as part of the staff report that a traffic analysis be submitted uh, during site plan review. Uh, even though the staff reports indicated be done at a later date, uh, my client has had a traffic analysis, traffic impact analysis uh, prepared. And at this point in time, I'd like to provide it to the city attorney. Uh, and ask it to be incorporated into this presentation. 
Also, the city clerk uh, and council have been uh, provided with a project report prepared by Holly White, who is the project engineer for the client. Uh, I request that that project report also be included as part of this presentation. Ms. White will testify following my presentation as to matters contained in her report. And that testimony will include information relative to the project as well as traffic generated by the project compared with other permitted uses on the site. Also with me is Seth Lane, Vice President of Development for Applicant, who's available to answer any questions. At that point, uh, I'd like to answer any questions the council may have. Mayor. Any questions? Just yes. a quick question. Um, thank you for providing this. Was this um, done after the PNZ meeting or? That, that's correct. This, this is complete. Okay. You're, you're looking at the uh, at the traffic and impact traffic analysis. Yes, yes sir. It, it wasn't even required until site plan review, but we felt it was necessary to bring it based upon the uh, the statement made by the chairman at that time, and and, and also uh, Ms. White will also address some of those issues in her report. Okay, that's correct. But right. no, it was not available. It wasn't required at that time. All right. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Council. Any additional questions? Ms. Sherman? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to bring up uh, Larry Bradley, our growth management director, and allow him to provide um, staff's overview of this particular um, application. Thank you. Uh, good evening again, Larry Bradley. Um, so in the staff report, there is um, some recommendations from staff and some commentary. Um, so I'm just going to go right to the conclusion statements that um, the uh, <clears throat> board and council has the right to impose additional conditions uh, that they deem necessary to um, ensure safety and harmony within the surrounding neighborhood. Um, some of the additional staff comments include the need for a utility agreement between the property owner and the city. Um, they must obtain all required uh, permits from St. John's River Water Management District, Melbourne Tillman, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Brevard County, uh, Department of Health. Uh, traffic impact analysis would be required as part of the site plan review, which was mentioned by the applicant. Uh, that would be reviewed as by the city engineer as part of that site plan review process. Uh, tree survey is also required um, to determine the preservation of any existing trees on site and also, um, as always, uh, building permits and engineered site plan will be reviewed prior to um, site plan issuance and then ultimately building permit. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick, oh, sorry. As you Qu were. Quick question for Mr. Bradley, I'm sorry. Um, so what would be the steps if, there, if you do see a concern when um, the traffic impact analyst is done by y'all? Well, they may have to do mitigation measures if there's a traffic issue, maybe a widening, maybe a turn lane. That's typically what happens when you get these traffic reports that there's a, a need for potential mitigation of the traffic impact. Okay, and then once those needs are, once those are met, then it moves forward. Correct. I mean, the city engineer would work with, uh, with us and the applicant to come up with a mitigation strategy for uh, something like a traffic impact. Okay, because that was really my only concern. Um, I've, I've been to McGriff St Skate Park multiple times, and anybody who goes down to Groot knows, um, you can't really see from here. It says 40 miles per hour, but the Palm APD in the back can attest that it's prob people aren't going 40 miles per hour down that road especially when it comes to that curve, which is where this project where this project is at. So that was my only concern, but I appreciate them doing the traffic impact. Yeah, and, and something like that with site distances, you can always have signage to, to tell people, uh, you know, there's a, a hidden curve or hidden driveway. Those are yeah. the things that can be done to alert the public as they're driving that uh, there's an, uh, an issue that may come up when they come around a curve like yeah. that. And then, because I'm thinking, you know, somebody's coming out of the, the commercial business and then somebody's come around that curve speeding when they mm -hmm. shouldn't. So that was my only concern right there. So mm -hmm. I appreciate okay. that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Follow up, Mayor, Mr. Bradley. Councilman Bailey. I had a, I had a question too. Um, not so much with the, on the vehicular traffic, mm -hmm. but I'm, I have a question about the, the pedestrian traffic. Did, have you had a chance to see this, by the way? I have not seen that. Okay, yes. I, I wasn't sure if it was handed to you but prior tonight. Um, I'm just curious, should this, ha should this include, should a traffic analysis include the pedestrian traffic? Um, it 
doesn't always. I mean, usually uh, traffic analysis is about vehicular movements. I mean, okay. there's a, a safety analysis that could also be done. Um, you know, we have uh, Mr. Wantanabe here. He could also maybe comment on that from a traffic perspective or a pedestrian safety perspective. Uh, but typically, those reports are uh, focused on vehicle traffic. Okay, thank you. I, I, and I'll, I'll ask the same question, if I may, to Mr. Uh, Spire. Um, to well, that. Hold, hold on one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, Council members have any additional questions? Councilman Forster from our staff? No. Councilman Felix? No, well, uh, not necessarily for Mr. Bradley. I'm okay. sure the uh, representative from the uh, uh, applicants coming, coming up to, to address that very traffic analysis. Is that correct? Okay. It's fine. Hello. Holly White, 720 Southwest 2nd Avenue, Gainesville, Florida. Um, a little bit of background about myself before going into this. Uh, I'm a licensed professional civil engineer. I uh, graduated from the University of Florida in 2011. I have about 12 years of experience, primarily in land development, but also a small amount in traffic transportation engineering as well. Um, I'll go right into the traffic data. A lot of stuff I'll say after that is kind of fill in some of the gaps from um, what may or may not have been included in the staff report. Um, the traffic analysis provided, it, um, it does state that there are no um, site obstructions based on the 40 mile per hour posted speed limit. This is based off of the city of Palm Bay, uh, the traffic methodology provided. So that will of course be coordinated during the site plan permitting process with the, civil or with the city engineer um, to be sure that all requirements are met and the driveway location is in the safest point possible. Um, within the development. Um, related to pedestrian traffic, I have this somewhere in the presentation. That was a concern that was brought up at the uh, neighborhood uh, meeting that we had for this. Um, the, there is no sidewalk all along the development side of DeGroote Road, but there is a sidewalk on the opposite side of the road. Um, there, no sidewalks in the in the city master plan for our development side of the road but we the applicant has at uh, past projects provided a mid-block crossing from the development to the opposite side of the road sidewalk connection um, they are willing to do that at this site it of course has to be approved deemed safe and approvable by public works um, so that can be that would be addressed during site plan permitting process but they are willing to put in you know a safe connection from the development to the opposite side of the roadway. Um, I'd like to address a little bit while I'm here. I don't, I sent in a presentation, not sure if it's there, but if you guys have the site plan in front of you, um, just kind of go over some of the details of the uh, site parameters required for the neighborhood commercial development. Um, the site plan that we have, we're not requesting a conditional use permit for the entire neighborhood commercial parcel. Uh, we're only asking for a portion of that. Um, within this portion, we are providing 25 foot buffers along the residential lot lines. There is a six foot fence along the residential lot lines as well. Uh, we're requesting a one, one single 10,700 square foot building with 54 parking spaces, which is the minimum required by code. Um, one single access is proposed to the entire parent parcel. Um, of course, that final location of that driveway will be determined during site plan um, pursuant to the traffic analysis and the city engineer. Uh, the proximity to the homes, uh, the closest point from a corner of the building to an existing home is 150 feet. Within that, it ranges from 150 feet up to 310 feet for the adjacent existing homes. Within that closest distance of 150 feet, the only thing it proposed in that as far as improvements is the stormwater management facility. So building corner, stormwater management facility, buffers, and then um, residential lot. Um, speaking to the site plan and the general parameters required in the neighborhood commercial district, those basic parameters, the 25 foot buffer along the residential lot lines, the six foot wood fence or six foot fence surrounding the boundary. Um, the next basic parameter required for neighborhood commercial district is a 30% maximum building coverage. Um, this one single 10,700 square foot building is only 14% building coverage for the portion of the site that we are looking at. 
um, with the 1.81 acre portion that we're, we're looking at, meeting the 25 foot buffer, six foot fence, 30% maximum building coverage, this site could potentially allow up to 20,000 square feet of development. So the neighborhood commercial district allows several different types of uses. Um, some of those uses are capped at a specific square footage of 5,000 square feet, which is the case of the retail store. Um, some do not have a cap. So a single 20,000 square foot building could be allowed for a laundry service, a library, various uses. Um, four 5,000 square foot daycare buildings could be there. Four 5,000 square foot discount retail store buildings could be there. Uh, we're just asking for one single 10,700 square foot store. Um, of course, those would all have to meet other city site plan requirements, just as we do as we go through the site plan permitting process. Um, but kind of expanding on the, the potential development of that site and what could be allowed by right, um, and back to the traffic, <laughs> uh, which was a big issue at planning and zoning. I uh, cre created a comparison table. Did you guys receive the presentation sent by any chance? Did you? Okay. Um, so I have a traffic generation comparison table. Uh, it's based on ITE code, which is Institute of Transportation Engineers, which is nationally used for traffic studies. Um, they assign a specific amount of trips to specific uses. So comparing that, and I have a few uses listed here that would be allowed by right. A 5,000 square foot convenient market could be allowed. This would generate up to 3,800 daily trips based on ITE. Um, 246 PM peak trips, which is between the hours of 4 PM and 6 PM. A walk-in bank does not have a square footage cap. It could allow up to 10,700 square feet, just as we're asking for by right. Uh, IT doesn't have a daily trips, but that would generate 130 p.m. peak hour trips. A fast casual restaurant, thinking Subway, Chipotle, that would be capped at 5,000 square feet. Uh, that would generate over 1,500 square feet, or 1,500 daily trips, excuse me. Um, up to 71 p.m. peak hour trips. A library, no cap there, could be a 10,700 square foot library, just the same size we're asking. Um, 771 daily trips. Um, we come in next, a uh, discount retail store, 10,700 square foot. Of course, we need uh, approval for this square footage. Um, this would generate 679 trips based on the standard ITE method. The traffic study provided does include a pass-by reduction that is allowed, which includes a reduction based on cars that would already be driving specifically past that location. Uh, that reduces the daily trips to 560 and the PM tri peak trips to 61. Um, sit down restaurants would be allowed at a 5,000 square feet. The daily trips for that would be 561, right in line with our 560 for what we're asking for a 10,700 square foot store. Um, so you can see we, we are asking for an additional square footage increase, um, but it, the traffic generated by this conditional use is you know, less than and very comparable to other uses and developments that could go in this location and be allowed by right without a conditional use permit at all. Um, we, the guidelines, uh, the city regulations for a conditional use, uh, there's items A through H that we address. The staff report addresses all of those thoroughly. If we haven't met it with the preliminary information, we will meet it during site plan permitting process. Um, I would like to point out item G, it's a little more could be a little more subjective. Uh, it states that the project will not co constitute a nuisance or a hazard based on the number of persons using the facility. <laughs> I hope that the comparisons that we've made for 20,000 square foot buildings that could be there um, pursuant to site, site plan code um, and the additional trips generated by other uh, projects that could be there as well. We, we hope that helps satisfy that requirement that this increase in square footage is not going to bring considerably more traffic than other uses that could go there by right. Uh, we are meeting the architectural style elevations, the Florida vernacular, um, which is one of the stylistic options outlined in 185.134. Uh, we did hold the neighborhood meeting. Uh, there were a few concerns, traffic being one, which we have addressed here tonight. Uh, light pollution was one, which uh, 
Palm Bay has very strict light pollution regulations, which will be met during the site plan permitting process. Um, and then the, of course, the general development style, uh, the specific tenants proposed at this location, the expected patrons of this, the store size, and the general quantity of this store was discussed. Um, this application addresses store size only and whether this store size um, meets items A through H and fits within the intent of the neighborhood commercial zoning. Um, pursuant to code, the neighborhood commercial, the purpose of the neighborhood commercial zoning is to provide limited commercial retail services um, to residences in the area to reduce conflict between adjacent residential uses and also relieve traffic from major adjacent thoroughfare roadways. Um, we believe that this project will, will meet that intent um, and will yeah, we'll meet the intent and reduce that traffic to the uh, adjacent roadways as the intent. Um, this track to summarize was zoned commercial in 1962 when it was platted uh, with the Port Malabar, Malabar plat, unit 32. Um, it has been vacant since then. The development proposed now said it's uh, 10,700 square feet we are requesting, coming in at a 14% maximum building coverage, well below the 30% maximum required. Uh, the site plan meets all buffer requirements, fencing requirements. Uh, we're willing to make sidewalk connections. Uh, we're not asking for anything outside of the parameters. We're simply asking for some judgment whether this door can be in at 10,700 square feet, um, considering that other, other uses could be provided here at this square footage or greater um, and generate a lot more traffic than what we we're asking for. So I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you may have. Council? Yeah, Mayor. Councilman Bailey? Yeah, go ahead, real quick, I wanted to do it why, since we, I, unfortunately we don't have it on the screen now, but the in, in your presentation, the trip generation comparisons? Yes. You have it highlighted and noted that the proposed net trips based on preliminary traffic study, that's the lower numbers, is that correct? Um, yes, the, the asterisk numbers on the discount retail store specifically. And so, this, so the higher numbers, the 679 and the 73, would be based just using that, the ITE code? Yes. For that yes. use. Right. Um, so I, guess that, I, I guess I'm curious to how that compares to the net for the others. Yes, yeah, so this specifically, the pass-by reduction, it's a standard 10% reduction, I think, allowed. Um, it applies to retail stores um, specifically, so that it may apply to the convenience market, um, could reduce up to 10% of that, which would still be well above mm -hmm. what we have, um, but may not apply to a walk-in bank. And, and can you help me, the, the convenience market, what differentiates it, it from a um, discount retail? Um, convenience market would be, I think, a gas station without gas pumps. Okay. Um, and your professional opinion, are, are those going up in these type of neighborhoods? I'm sorry, could you repeat the that? The convenience, the convenience. Oh. Yeah, would, they, would, that, would that site be you know, available for convenient mar convenience market? I mean, in, the, in practicality? At a, a convenience market could be developed at that site at 5,000 square feet and go straight through staff site mm -hmm. plan and never come to a planning and zoning or conditional use or a city council board for approval. Yeah, I understand, but we're you're, we're trying. You're 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 giving us the theoretical based on what's mm -hmm. in the code. Yes. I don't. It does. It sounds like maybe earlier you said that it had to meet other portions of the code as well. So I don't know. If there's oh. been a complete analysis um, of uh, it, no theoretically based on one part of the code. It could be this much, but let's make it apples to apples. I'm just asking your opinion. I understand that theoretically there could be a convenience store there mm -hmm. that could walk through staff administrative, administrative administratively. I'm just curious if that's really legitimate, like in practicality, that we would put a convenience store, that, any, that you or your client or anybody else would put a convenience store in that location. Understood. Um, so when I say the theoretical, this could go here based on other site, pl site code requirements. Um, the one thing that majorly comes to mind is parking requirements. Um, I believe a convenience market, I don't have the code in front of me, I believe a convenience market would require the um, same square parking space per square footage that the retail store requires, that we require. Um, so they could go there, fit on that same portion of the site at a very much smaller building coverage, um, but 
they, in my opinion, based on what I know, they could go there by right. Okay, and, and I guess what I'm addressing is feasibility of a yes, convenience yes. market in that location as compared yes. to the discount retail. Um, but um, my, my other question is, and I don't know if you can answer, are you familiar with this? Or I don't know if Mr. S no, if, if you um, can answer I'm, Mr. I'm familiar with it, yes. Okay, I'm just curious, Does I, 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 you know, obviously we just received this and right. um, I did do a you know, cursory review without, you know, while you were coming up to, um, while we were having you know, speakers come up and forth. Yes. Uh, to see if it addresses pedestrian safety in here anywhere, does it? And can you point me to where if it does? I actually, um, I don't know if it addresses pedestrian safety. And I, I'd have to go back and look. I don't think pedestrian safety was in the, in the methodology for this area. Um, and because there are no sidewalks on our development side of the road, um, that's, that wouldn't specifically address it. So said where the applicant's willing to put in a crossing to the other side. Um, that's what's called a, a mid-block crossing, which is uh, not preferable to um, a lot of city engineers. So that would be, that's I said, it's something we're willing to do. It's not, it's not the ideal location for that. It's not required, um, but through the pursuit to a traffic study, our traffic engineer, and the city engineer, we would try to coordinate as much as possible to provide pedestrian traffic do um, alternatives there. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. sorry to cut you off. <laughs> do, do discount retail stores tend, tend to have pedestrian traffic? Um, I mean, I, I guess I can't really speak to that, but <laughs> um, if they're for neighborhoods, I think a lot, I, I would guess, yes, they have some. I wouldn't say that it's the most, most of it. Do you have that? Sure. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, good evening, Seth Lane, Concept Companies, uh, 241 Atlantic Boulevard, uh, Neptune Beach, Florida. I can address that specifically. Um, there is pedestrian traffic. It really depends on the urbanicity of the location. Um, the locations that are in higher, more densely populated areas will have a higher pedestrian customer base. Um, locations that are in more uh, suburban locations will have a much lower customer base. It really depends on the customers that they're serving, but um, like Holly said, we're happy to provide pedestrian safety measures if pedestrian traffic is a concern and safety is a concern. Um, and just a general question, who, no, I mean, obviously it's your application. The, uh, so whoever would like to answer it, I, I just want to make sure I have the, you know, if we're going to move forward, item A includes not just vehicular traffic, which is, or safety, which, and, and uh, motions, which this covers, but includes the pedestrian, and I'm just not seeing that addressed. So that's why I'm trying to ask some questions to get that uh, addressed. Sure, fully. we would be happy to work with the, the city engineer and the safety officials here to address um, pedestrian safety. As Holly mentioned in the past, we have provided those crosswalks across the street. Mid-block crossing is not ideal. If there's an alternate mitigation strategy, we would be happy to consider that and, and make that a condition to the approval. And, and to expand on that item A, it's not, it's not something that our plan or application is lacking because we don't want to provide it. It's not, um, yeah, the, there's no sidewalks there. They're not in the city master plan. Nothing has been required. The, those conversations haven't happened. Um, it's not because we're not willing to do it, but the, the city master plan is not, doesn't include sidewalks there. Um, so those, like I said, those conversations just haven't happened, but we're willing to do whatever alternative to provide that pedestrian traffic safety um, that we can work out with the city engineer safely. So you would install, um I mean, it's still somebody's going to have to cross somewhere mid-block. The bottom yes. line is people are going to cross mid-block. I mean, we yes. agree on that, I think, um, unfortunately. And, but what you're saying is that you guys would be open to what I'm curious about today, because I, I have to consider, you know, us individually have to consider what's in our code. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the one thing that I want to see that it, it's addressed is pedestrian safety. Are you guys saying you guys would be willing to put a sidewalk in front of your, um, your location? Yes. Yes. And, okay. and, you know, that was brought up before as a sidewalk to nowhere, but. <laughs> I, under, yeah, um, I understand. But, yes. Okay, and then the real quick question, this will be my final one, Mayor, I apologize, is trying to Carry get on. things on the record. Um, the other question I have is for the buffer. I understand that portions of the parent property are not included in the conditional use application. Um, the, on the west, it's kind of like, it looks like it's northwest to me, um, right. uh, section, the back of the property, essentially. Mm -hmm. 
with that buffering, is the intent of that buffering to extend only to where this conditional use is going, or is it going to go to the end of the parent property? Uh, the, the buffer inherently applies to the entire parent property just because of the neighborhood commercial zoning. That's what's required uh, within that zoning along the residential lot lines. So we, we don't show that or extend that, but at the time where that remaining parcel, if it's developed, it would have to um, illustrate and maintain that buffer. So the, so the fence buffering would go to the tree line where the parent property, or that the rest of the property is adjacent to it, essentially. The, yes. And then there would be tree, it would be, no, the yes. green. Uh, the rest would buffering. remain yeah. undeveloped as is. Okay. All right, thank you. Deputy Mayor Johnson, it's all come. Uh, Councilman Foster. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, under the code requirements, what I'm interested in is um, item E. The lighting. What that that road? I'm very familiar with it. It's very dark. It's no lighting on that road. Am I correct? Did I look at a, the lighting study of the, around that um, particular property? I unfortunately have not looked at the the lighting of that particular. Okay. Okay. But so, what type of lighting would be? on that property, would it be bright enough for cars to notice that they're about to approach that business or people walking won't be walking in the dark? What type of lighting and how bright the lighting would be? Yes, sir. Um, the, there will be lighted signage. The parking lot will be, um, will provide pole lighting uh, for lighting there. The city of Palm Bay has specific lighting requirements that are, um, deemed safely for parking lots, a, a sufficient amount of lighting, as well as mandating um, minimum trespass lighting. Usually it's a, it's a foot candle, zero foot candles at a residential lot line. Um, so the code, the code is written in such a way to provide as much safety and lighting for the, for the project itself, for the actual parking and the pedestrian areas that people will be in, but also, um, you know, not, not spill over onto uh, residential uses as well. Okay. So that that is all reviewed during the site plan permitting process, um, and it is taken care of during code uh, based on the code requirements. But the as previous engineer <laughs> mentioned, yeah. um, you know, city staff does pay attention to that stuff, and uh, they're they're diligent about making sure that code requirement is met. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Felix. Yes, uh, I don't necessarily have a question, but it's more of a series of comments. Um, well, first of all, I, I wish that the traffic analysis was ready or handed to staff prior to a few minutes ago. It would be great in the future. That may be something yeah. to consider. Um, I'm very familiar to the area, the, the, the group, that, that very section, a family member that actually reside right off Sexton towards the back. Um, again, traffic seems to be the center of our conversation, right? Um, so obviously what you guys asking, um, you could just go ahead and put a store there, um, within meet the requirement of the code, uh, 5,000 or, or, or less. Um, I'm still not convinced in terms of the, just, the looking at the curve, just the, the way, the nature of the neighborhood itself, um, my biggest concern is if you're traveling south on the groove, I mean, it, it could be, it could be, and, and obviously 40, 40 miles an hour, no one really does it. Uh, maybe, you know, at time, Chief's not here, at time I may violate it myself. So um, I, I'm still not quite convinced that could potentially be an issue. Um, I just wanna, Based on, for instance, I'm, I'm just imagine an uh, 18 wheeler trying to deliver mm -hmm. a merchandise. Is there a particular point of time during the day, based on the traffic study, um, in terms of you know, is there a specific time? Because if 18 wheeler trying to make a, a left or a right into the property, that that could be very. And I got two teenage kids, and I guarantee you, I mean day not i'm just thinking ahead and mm -hmm. and the traffic density may be you know kind of low now we are growing city we're growing at you know uh, like crazy i mean 
So it's not five years from now, it's a whole different ball game, and that's not gonna change. So, but the traffic study today, not gonna, it'll be useless five years from now as the rate we, the city is growing. So I'm thinking ahead. Um, I have a hard time with, with, with this, and that, that's my concern. I have some serious concern. And um, that question, you know, maybe for staff, um, so should we approve this and as we discover, we uncover issues, traffic issues, do we, I mean, I think you address it, but do we actually, can we hold the developer or the builder, um, can we hold, hold them to where they have, we have to fix it, we have to take care of whatever necessary, whether it's an additional turning lane or, or what have you. Um, th 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 these are some of the issues I have, so. Um. Uh, I'll speak to some of, some of the traffic related information first. Um, as far as this, this conditional use permit doesn't allow us to get away with anything um, that isn't safe. We still have to go through the site plan permitting process, which is very diligent, which um, staff will review everything very thoroughly. Um, the, as far as the curvature of the roadway, that was taken into consideration when evaluating the, uh, the, the site parameters, uh, which is included in the traffic study. And um, of course, that is also based on the speed limit. But this parcel and this parcel is zoned for a neighborhood commercial, and things that I'm could sorry. go in there allowed by right would also need a driveway at this location. Um, so this that doesn't that doesn't take away from <laughs> take away from a driveway being there. But you know, we're going through all the stops ahead of time to to try to make this as safe and seamless as possible throughout that, that permitting process. Um, again, the, the traffic analysis also states that the, um, the additional traffic for the PM peak hour, which is between four and six, it will be a maximum of 23 vehicles per direction. Um, so that's based on field studies data. Um, at that at specifically at that location so 23 additional maximum vehicles per day per direction and that still maintains the st same level of service that the roadway has right now and um, the capacity that the roadway was designed for uh, Seth, Seth Lane has more information regarding the uh, truck traffic for the for the business model though because so as, as far as delivery um, is there would the business model would consider when do we, you know, 18 wheeler would be going in and out of the of the property? Sure, thank you. Um, if I may just address one comment you made, the traffic study uh, is typically a part of our site plan application. After we would go to this hearing, we would move forward, and it would be part of our uh, our full package that we submit for consideration. Uh, because of the planning and zoning uh, chairman's objection and question about traffic, we went ahead and initiated the traffic study now in advance of this hearing. Unfortunately, uh, the rules of those, the rules of engagement with traffic studies is you can't take data during kind of non-normal times. And so planning and zoning was in November. We immediately engaged our traffic engineer to do the study. He had to, he was very limited on the days that he was allowed to collect data because of school being out, the holidays, and so, um, unfortunately, we did not have an advanced copy to provide to staff, but we did engage him immediately, and due to some of the constraints of the holidays, the, the turnaround time on the study was delayed because of that data collection restriction. Um, so, as far as truck traffic goes, they do take deliveries typically once per week with a semi-truck, and they typically do it before business hours, um, and business hours do vary by location, but are typically you know, in the 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock range, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., so typically the truck traffic is once per week. They come and deliver before the store opens and they are gone before the store opens. Um, they deliver the new material, they take the recyclables uh, away and they're gone. So um, very rarely is there a semi-trailer that would be servicing the store during normal business hours. Um, occasionally you will get a box truck, a, a bread truck, a Coca-Cola truck that would come during other times, but the main kind of big semi-truck delivery is uh, not during store hours in the mornings and typically once per week. So my comments, first I'd like to thank uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson for bringing up McGriff Skate Park. That was uh, done as a memorial to an outstanding football player from 
Palm Bay High School that left our community much too soon. We, we knew he would be an outstanding NFL player, probably leading a team to the Super Bowl. So I just wanted to say that I'm familiar with that park as well and the dedication. So I, I wanted to mention his name uh, in that regard. I echo uh, the council's sentiments uh, regarding that, that curvature there, that, that turning lane, uh, and, and the safety of it. Uh, so my, my questions are more along the lines of what can we address, and I, I want to thank you for the study uh, because it wasn't required, but because you adjusted, you improvised, you adapted, you provided it today, although I'm sure council would have preferred and staff preferred it sooner, but thank you. You took that initiative, so I, I really appreciate that. Uh, my, my concerns are, again, that, that, that turn lane, and whether you're coming from the, the north or the south uh, to make a, a left turn at, at that intersection when there's, there, there's a potential blind spot there. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is the area of our concern, and I think I've heard that from, from our council members. Um, what, and I know we haven't even looked at this study, sir, uh, so my question may be at a disadvantage at this point, uh, but what, since that is an issue for us, and Councilman Felix, he's talking about the future, I'm talking about even right now, what can, is there something that you guys, I know that you mentioned that you were looking at that, um, however, you can't judge it by whatever traffic studies you could have done, because you're absolutely right, school has not been in, 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 in effect in 2020. Traffic has been at a reduction, typically. So what is there, do you think, that could be done to address it? Is it a larger uh, on-ramp uh, lane, uh, something, uh, a turning lane, or what, what is it that you see that could be addressed? So I am not a, a traffic engineer or a civil engineer, so I would leave it up to the safety professionals of your community to, to make that decision. In the past, we have done uh, acceleration and deceleration lanes, yes. left, left hand turn lanes, right hand turn lanes. Um, the purpose of the traffic study was sort of to illustrate that it, it's not the boogeyman that I think the planning and zoning uh, chairman may have thought it was, but we are absolutely, we want to create a safe environment for our customers. We want to create a safe environment for the employees and for your community. And so we are willing to do whatever is needed to make it, a, make it safe, but we're going to take that direction from your engineering staff and um, you know, professional traffic engineers. So yes, we are open to conditions that would meet that requirement, um, and we'd be happy to hear those, um, but it is going to take um, a cooperation once we get to that site planning stage we have more technical data in the design documents to really figure out what that looks like and what does create the safest condition but we are absolutely on the same page that that's what we want and that's what we, that's what you want as well your, your comments are duly noted I believe mr. Spira mentioned something or wanted to make a comment at this point I'm regarding asking, that I'm just asking a question. as you were as you were any further questions council yeah, mayor May I, ask, may I ask um, Ms. Sherman, um, just quickly, I know we're looking for competent evidence. Uh, I know our staff is available and have reviewed it. Uh, I know we have, you know, we have fire, police, no growth, public works, um, and others. Have they considered the pedestrian safety in that area? Um, I'll bring up staff to talk through that. I don't know who's Yeah, either Larry or Frank, whoever feels uh, most ready to talk about that. I, I just wanted to make sure that that's cleared yep. for me. And while Frank comes up, uh, your comments about the egress, the egress uh, lane uh, is duly noted. I really appreciate your comments, sir, and your willingness to work with our civil engineers. Thank you. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, Frank Watanabe, the public works director and your city engineer. Uh, just to put, put a note, I am a licensed traffic engineer for 30 years. I came from California. You're required to be a licensed traffic engineer to do traffic engineering, and I am a licensed traffic engineer. Uh, I haven't seen the study, so I apologize. Just saw it right now. I'm well, looking at it. Uh, we had concerns early on when it was a smaller unit, the 5,000 square foot. The, the issue of the reverse curve, we all know it's not a good location. It's on the reverse side of the, of the curve where the, actually the FPNL station is on the better side for access because of the reverse curve. Uh, that being said, you can't stop a development from developing a, a piece of property. The question you guys had regarding pedestrian safety is an issue too. The sidewalk is on the, on the east side, not on the west side. More likely, if you want to provide connectivity, 
this project should provide connectivity along the west side to the nearest intersection so they won't have mid block crossings. So you'll provide crossings away from that curb, make them cross at the nearest streets, and that would be a lot safer. Uh, the issue regarding uh, turn lanes, you know, I just checked right now, DeGroote has about 9,200 cars. That area is gonna keep growing. As we know, 3132 is growing. That area has a high school down there, it has a lot of traffic that a lot of these studies do not take into account. Um, based on all those potential increases in traffic, the suggestion of having some security, such as a left turn lane, would be my highest uh, review when looking at the study, uh, because a lot of times you don't, they don't consider those factors. Uh, the trip generation rate that he, she showed, their trip generation rates, I just pulled it up myself, and they used uh, 814, I would have used 815, which is a, a standalone discount store. The, the volumes are still gonna be low, but they're just trip generation rates. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an averaging curve, so it, it changes dramatically sometimes points on a dot. So based on those information, just give me some facts on what I know about the area. Uh, it is a high speed area. We all know, we all, we all know that. Uh, the issue with protection for the pedestrian would be, my suggestion would be a sidewalk on the west side for kind of activity, at least up to the park. Uh, and then a left turn lane, more likely to provide for that security when a car is making left. The right I have no concerns about is when that left turn, especially if it's gonna be a larger truck, especially if that truck has difficulty because it can't see beyond a certain point. So those are my two cents without looking at the study. Follow up? But absolutely, Councilman. So the so make sure I was clear that your professional opinion, the recommendation would be up to the Fred McGriff Park, correct? Uh, for connectivity, for walkability, definitely. And because the sidewalk's on the reverse side. Yeah, and what about to the south? Uh, there's an intersection at Saxon Road? Saxon would be the next one, the correct. Because so that's a four-way. Okay. All right. Thank you. And the turning lane. Thank you. Council? Um, I, I don't know if the applicant wants to respond, but I certainly want to ask them a yes. question if they don't. Um, just a quick note on sidewalk limits. Uh, we are willing to put in the sidewalk, as uh, Seth Lane mentioned. Just want to keep in mind all of site parameters, restrictions, other people's property, that kind of stuff, but <laughs> before we promise to put sidewalk in everywhere. Um, there is a lot to work out during the site plan permitting process, as well as the, the left turn lane that uh, Mr. Watnaby mentioned. Um, the, we hesitate to say, yes, we will put in a left turn lane, and then during the site plan permitting process, it's determined that's not needed, um, and that be on the restriction. So we'll just leave to, yeah, coordination with site plan permitting and uh, Mr. Watnaby during the site plan process once he has had a chance to review the uh, traffic analysis. So my question is, you know, and you can somewhat address it, but I just want to know, we just heard from, at least from our, you know, the, the, what I have yes. for staff right now, the recommendation of connectivity, which, mm -hmm. you know, as a layperson makes sense to me. As yes. you mentioned yourself earlier, you know, having a sidewalk to nowhere, it's not that useful. Uh, but extending out to points where crossings can be had that are not mid-block might be safer is what I heard and what I, what I, what I think is a layperson, too. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm just curious, if, if it's feasible, if you can get the access, would you be willing to do from Saxon to the park as yeah. just recommended? Yeah. We would absolutely be willing to do that to the extent that the property rights are there for us to do that. Um, I can't promise you that I'm gonna go be able to get an easement from a neighboring property owner to build a sidewalk on their property, but to the extent the mm -hmm. city controls right of way where we could put that in a safe location, yes. Okay, that, that means sure. that that's, that's a, is there any recommendation on a city attorney or city or staff of how we could word that um, to make sure we can incorporate that and see if we're, that's something that can be done? And to include the lanes. As far as sidewalks, we could um, incorporate, uh, I guess we would use the um, term that Mr. Watanabe, was it the connectivity to the extent practical and recommended during the site plan um, review. So we put it out there and we, uh, as they have stated, we make sure that that is something that is recommended and is appropriate and then would be determined upon site plan review. Certainly, if Mr. Watanabe reviewed it at that time and thought that it was applicable and appropriate, that would then certainly be a condition that we've already agreed upon. Okay. 
All right, well, just one of those things sometimes, Mayor, we know they don't want to say yes now. Well, well I don't want to, we might not want to say yes without you saying yes either. So it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, just we're dancing. That's we, okay. we can agree to that as a condition so long as we're not required to get right away or an easement from a, an unrelated property owner. That's fair. We, we're really excited about the lane opportunity. We, we really feel that, and, and uh, Mr. Watanabe mentioned it just by briefly looking. He, he understands the area. He's traveled the area. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that opportunity to, for that to occur. Any other questions, Council? Is there anyone in the public that wishes to speak for or against this item? Mr. Bill Batten. In 586 Ocean Spray Street Southwest. Most of the items I was going to bring up were already discussed in this, and so this was a good conversation by my standards. Uh, also, I kind of agree that the traffic study was would have been nice to have been able to look at because you know I do go through this agenda packet. It would have been nice to review it if it would have been there, but it wasn't there, so be that. All right. And so my question was, had the city council been able to see it at all to, to make a decision on it? All right. Hopefully the comp plan will be able to solve a problem like this because of the design in that S turn, the comp plan probably would have solved this the problem and said, well, your comp plan says you can do this because that's what's there. Hopefully the comp plan, I'm going to keep pushing that button from now on, that comp plan would have saw that this was a bad location to be put in something right in that blind S curve. Uh, one thing that didn't come out when we were talking about the S curve, the blind curve, was the fact that it's a no passing zone. So even if there was a problem coming out that you could not go to the other lane to get away from it. And now if you take that no passing zone and you put a pedestrian crosswalk right in the middle of it, you're, I'm not going to say nothing's going to happen, but I've watched the number of accidents on that road right there already. I'm going on 33 years here on the same street, same location, so I definitely know it. And that's what's going to, what I see is potentially going to happen. Pedestrian crosswalk in a blind curve coming out of a convenience store or whatever's going to be there, All right? So I'm going to point out the fact that P and Z, planning and zoning, did kind of recommend disapproval of it. And judging by what's being said here tonight, I understand your your dilemma but that's why you're sitting there and I'm up here talking about it okay good luck you guys but it is a very dangerous location especially because you can't go the other way even if you have a turn lane in one one side to an, a turn lane coming into the store that's great but coming from the opposite direction in a no pass zone you're still locked up and you're right they do speed down that road thank you Mr. David Moala. Good evening, Mayor, member of the councils. I'm David Moala, 1663 Georgia Street, Palm Bay. I am the owner of the subject property. And funny thing about it is I purchased this site from the city of Palm Bay with understanding that it's zoned neighborhood commercial. And it has been the neighborhood commercial since general development lay flat to the city. Now I'm sitting over here, you know, I see economic development division with a 10 employee and now you wanna add some more and you like to see commercial development and that's where your bread and butter is. And then you come and grill uh, this project to such extent, you know, which I understand, but some, some of it I don't understand. You know, people, you have a 40 mile per hour zone that the people go on it, whatever they want. You know, you, you, that's, that's the function of the police department. I suggest with as much development that we are seeing in the Palm Bay, perhaps, that need to be enforced and around the curve area perhaps should be lowered 
So the residents understand that you know you, you just this is not a racetrack. There are variable speeds. Some portions of it go a little bit faster, but police need to enforce it, and that would be for the safety of all. The other matter is that on the positive side, this store is going to eliminate so much traffic in the city that currently going to go to Malabar Road, Palm Bay Road, Bayside, etc., to do a bunch of purchases. This store is going to is a general store, you know, it has so many different items that would take care of the neighborhood, and that's, this is a neighborhood commercial. It eliminates a lot of traffic from the city, so it's badly needed, and it would also generate the dollars that uh, we badly need. And all of you promised to bring commercial development, but then you come over here and you know, we grill these things to the point that we want to kill it. And, you know, I have had this land for two decades. I've been paying high taxes on it. I like to put it onto use. It can be a, a convenience store. You cannot stop it. It can be something else. You're going to have the same issue. So, you know, the traffic, we need to answer it. We need to lower the speed limit, police it, give some tickets and make the people understand this is not a racetrack. I encourage you to approve this item. You don't need to concern so much yourself with the traffic and this and that, and I appreciate it, but that's the professionals. Let them do it. The engineers, you have professionals in the city that are gonna permit this, I understand all of your concerns, and I'm glad that I, I hear it over here, that we recognize the people speed over there. Let's police it. Let's lower the speed limit. They're building a lot of houses. We cannot go with these things that, you know, it, it, I've been on that road that, you know, I mean, you, you have some, some portions of it is no, no speed, but they come over there and pass you with such a speed. We need to police that. We cannot just say, oh, let's kill this project because people will speed over there. You know, we have a 40 miles per hour, let's be a 40 hours. You know, if it's too much, let's lower it. Uh, I have this zoning and I have the land, and for every acre, I'm entitled to 10,000 square feet. They're using two acres for 10,000 square feet. I'm also entitled to be able to use my property. I've been paying taxes for 20 years on these things since I purchased it from the city. Let the professionals do their job and let's bring some dollars to the city coffers too. You know, we just cannot be, keep on building houses and cater to them to a speed if they want to, whatever speed they want. I haven't seen a police over there whenever I travel over there. And it's not a really a road that you, you go really fast. It's only a two-lane road. I appreciate, I encourage you to approve this project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public uh, that wishes to speak for or against this item? Sorry. If you have spoken during this public hearing, please fill out a blue card and turn it in to Mrs. Terry right here when you get the chance. You, you can still approach, but when you get the chance, please fill out a blue card. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Eddie and Margaret Hardison, 1230 Sexton Road, Southwest Palm Bay. Um, we will be most affected by this approval. It's right at our back door. Um, we see the traffic that comes through here. My, one of my biggest concerns now um, after stating about the traffic before is the foot traffic after I really thought about um, the park being right adjacent to, well, not too far from that, the children will walk the sidewalk and then try to cross the street to go to the store. Um, 
I'm just trying to figure out what is the big necessity for this store going into this neighborhood. There is a Dollar General within five minutes either direction. So why are we building another one? Um, hearing tonight that this has been zoned commercial for many years, but yet we build all of these houses around it. Now we want to and plant some business in there was gonna bring a very big amount of traffic. Um, still again, what is the necessity? I can't figure that out. We've already been affected by the electrical plant by um, being put, that being put in there. One of my biggest concerns is the speed, the speed coming through there. We're right on the corner and I'm afraid someone is gonna come through there one day lose control and come straight into my bedroom. That has nothing to do with the store, but I'm just saying there's so much traffic right there already and that's just gonna generate even more traffic coming into that little tiny area. Um, I beg you, please do not approve this because it's just gonna cause even more havoc than that's already there. Thank you. Me May, may I ask a question real quick? Sure. Yes. Um, can you help me, uh, and I forgive me, I, I missed your name again, I'm sorry. Hardison, Margaret Hardison. Hardison. Ms. Hardison, um, the, which, which property, I just, just want to put, put you on the map, which property are you, are you at the, are you on the, off, just off of the grid, or are 12, you behind I it am on the west? I am 1236 in the corner lot, Sexton. right on that, um, the grid and Sexton. The grid and Sexton, okay. Just south, I guess. No, no, Sexton's on the north. North. So your oh, right base is north the towards the park, correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it would be through your property we're talking about as far as the connectivity for yes. sidewalks. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that's all, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak for or against this item? No, but speaking cards. Any other questions? Mrs. Spear? I just want to address a couple of comments. I, I think with regards to Mrs. Hardison, I understand the traffic issue. Certainly, we, we've all heard that uh, this afternoon. I just want to point out that the traffic is there now. The additional traffic, this will not add additional traffic. Certainly, the, any permitted use that can go on that site uh, is going to generate more traffic than this would use, or, or certainly at least the same amount of traffic. So the traffic is, a, is an issue. I think the issue that was brought up, I think that's been a, the, the sort of focused in by council, is, is what, what can be done? How can this be handled? And I think the applicant has indicated they're willing to, to do whatever is uh, uh, required by the city, by city staff, agreed to with uh, the traffic engineer and uh, Mr. Watanabe. Uh, to, to resolve this issue. I mean, it is, it is a situation as exists right now. They've certainly indicated their willingness to, to work with the city to try to come up with some resolution uh, to, uh, to address any potential problems that may exist. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone else wish to speak for or against this item? Seeing and hearing none, I'm closing the public hearing. Council, what is your pleasure? Motion to approve case CU-29-2020 with staff's recommendations one through five to include um, a sidewalk um, connecting, Fred McGriff. connecting to um, James McGriff Park if um, property right away can be provided as well as uh, turning lane. Uh, motion by Deputy Mayor Johnson, seconded by Councilman Foster. Discussion, Council? P point of order real quick, Mayor. Uh, does the Deputy Mayor uh, mind amending that to go south to Saxton as well? Uh, or, he says Sexton or Saxton? Yeah, those, you those, say? I know those roads are very yes, <laughs> yes, similar. Yes. yes. I don't know. I, I want to make sure clarity of your intent yes, of the motion. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then so I'll I'll, I'll to yes I'll amend my motion. Okay. Mr. Mr. McGriff. Yes. Sorry. I'll I'll amend my motion to include the following. Say say from Saxon. From oh, I'm Sa sorry. It's not Saxon. It's Sex Sexon. Sexton. S E X. Sexton. No, no. There's Sexton's on the is on the north side of the property. Right. 
Saxony. Thank you. I'm Saxony. sorry. I was calling it. I, 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 I look. I, I'm not a. I'm not an orator. Um, but Saxony is the road to the south. That was the road that I was that I was referring to earlier. I don't know if I need to make that a point of order uh, for the Upon applicant. It, I think what it's we the plug. The public hearing is closed. What we also want to do is, as far as the um, any of the sidewalk or the um, traffic impact uh, mitigation, condition that upon a, a recommendation and approval of the uh, city engineer during the uh, site plan review. Okay. Yeah. All right. Then I'll amend uh, my motion to include the city attorney's suggestion. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Councilman Foster, any further discussion, Council? I'll, I'll go first, Mayor. Um, and I think all of Council is on the same page in regards to traffic um, impact, as well as you hear our community. Um, but in this case, and I, I agree with Mr. Moalam, we all, right before when Mrs. Uh, Brown was speaking, we we're talking about commercial growth, you know, but at the same time, more important than commercial growth is community safety. And we want to ensure that as well. But I do have um, the utmost confidence in Mr. Watanabe when he came up here and spoke, and I'm glad Councilman Bailey called him up, um, that he's going to make sure he sees this with a fine, you know, with a fine tooth pen, and um, he's going to make sure everything's addressed so that way our, this area is safe and this area is um, adequate for our community. So I appreciate you, Mr. Watanabe. I appreciate the applicant, Mr. Moalam. Everybody's trying to do their due diligence in this council. And um, Mrs. Smith, thank you for uh, helping me out on that. So that's all, Mayor. Any further discussion, Council? Councilman yeah, Bailey? Matt? I'll defer to Mr. Foster if he would like to. Councilman Foster? Yeah, I, I think the applicant met um, the requirement. They, they did a traffic study. And um, I looked over this traffic study while it was talking and you know, these done by professional people. So when we, when we, and I know a little bit about traffic accidents, um, cause I worked them as a police officer and I travel that road. That is a dangerous road, but it's not because the business owners want to put a business there because the way the road is and the way the citizens drive down that road. If we don't have no business there right now in that commercial it still be a traffic it's a traffic hazard it's a traffic hazard right now and that's not the business they're, they're not traffic enforcers so they, they shouldn't be held but they also have a duty for safety and we as a council yes like the deputy mayor said state uh, commercial growth is important but safety is my number one important when it comes to our citizens. We, we have a duty up here to make sure the citizens of Palm Bay is safe, okay? So if you put a business there, yeah, it's gonna be some traffic because people are gonna go shop. But um, I looked at your report, I looked at the executive summary, and it says no, no adverse traffic impact onto group road will result from adding an addition uh, project. And then you got a on-site observation report in here. And it talks about pedestrian. And one of the, was it, was it that? Uh, do parking maneuvers MP other vehicles? No. Um, is there a major road vehicle slow turn to impede other vehicles? No. I mean, so yeah, I did your homework, um, and I invite people to, to read that um, on-site observation report, because I don't think nobody on the council did an on-site observation report, so I appreciate this report. But um, the reason I seconded the motion is because I want to make sure that we do address the safety concerns of people walking on that side of the street where there's no sidewalk and we have a turning lane. And, um, and so your customers could turn in that property safe or come out of that property safe and not get hit. 
I addressed the lighting. Lighting is very important. Nobody talked about lighting. But driving there at night, you, it's dark right now. You might have customers coming out there and a car can't not see or blinded by the light on that curve. So lighting is very important to me. So I want to make sure that uh, you put good lighting up there because there's no lighting on that street. There's no lighting on that street right now. So you're going to have cars and headlights coming out of that, that location. So if, if your property is well lit, that's going to bring attention to the driver to slow down. And they're going to see people walking at night or pulling out of that um, uh, business at night. So I just want to make them comments, and that's, that's my concern. Thank you. Councilman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, and I apologize because I think I created, a little, I think maybe we understood each other, but I know I said the wrong word with Sax, Saxony. Is that correct? The motion is to go south as well as to north. I think that was our conversation with Mr. Watanami. Okay. Um, just want to make sure I got that clear for the record because um, I want to make sure we're, we have safety on both sides. That is my primor, primary concern. There's a reason why I voted against a similar application. I believe it was the same applicant actually on um, Emerson. Uh, it was just because it was on a curve. We have a, re a discount retail, st retail store, Dollar General, or dollar, no, one of the dollar stores, um, in that location. It was a concern. And you know, and quite frankly, I just want to address real quick the owner of the property, Mr. Mo Allen, which we all know is you know, one of the largest vacant lot owners in the in the city, or the largest. Um, I think that the scrutiny that we, we've given tonight is what's required in our code. Um, it is there on purpose. Safety, you know, item A, safety is the most important. I think it's A. Uh, for a reason for us to consider first and not skip over um, and I think my questions were to get us there and I'm actually you know I will be frank with you without the sidewalk there without hearing you know competent substantial evidence from our staff um, I think that would have been a hole for me and uh, we're here to look for you know unique functional characteristics it says in our code um, and th that potential incompatibility and I think that there is some with pedestrians uh, seeing that that is going to be addressed to the extent possible, um, I, I will give support uh, to this item. I still don't think this is probably the best place, but there are rights that have been uh, bestowed upon this property, and I think the property owner has the right to to uh, to use it. And so that's why I'm going to do that tonight with that uh, with that clarification that we have the safety things addressed. I'm not too concerned about the the traffic. I think that that's more routine. I think that the vehicular traffic is is regularly handled by Public Works. Pedestrian is just one that I think is particularly important. Being you no know, member of TPO, um, you know I don't go overboard in, in things, uh, but I do understand that pedestrian and bicycle, you no know, pedestrian traffic. That's when people are going to die. And so I think that it, 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 it's worth considering. The, uh, the lighting, I think, was adequately addressed, and I think the other uh, items here were too. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Councilman Felix. Yeah, we, uh, we, we obviously uh, discussed this in great detail, and, and we addressed quite a bit uh, different aspect of the, of the request of the applicant. Um, again, I'm glad as a... Councilman Bailey mentioned um, many uh, ask of the uh, of the applicant from the you know side uh, the side you know uh, addressing the the side works uh, aspect and and bringing uh, the the city engineer uh, up and was able to share with us some some of his concern as well. Um, I'm still not a hundred percent sold. Um, on the idea, but also there's a fine, a fine, you know, line there because we also um, is a council that is looking to grow, looking for business uh, uh, to bring business into the city. Um, so uh, again, you know, I'm still, but but I, I see I I, I I see both sides. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it as that. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, my comments are I'm glad that we did discuss uh, these details. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, uh, Mr. Moellen. Uh, it is about increasing our commercial uh, enterprise here in, in the city of Palm Bay, but never compromising the safety of our citizens, as so eloquently it was put by our deputy uh, mayor, Johnson. Um, at this time, I uh, want to call the action to a vote. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, next item, unfinished business. Next item, unfinished business, Mrs. Smith or Ms. Smith. I know at our last meeting there were questions as far as the um, pension um, board, as far as whether council could appoint someone uh, prior to the end of the term. And so I did um, provide the memo. Council does appoint two um, members to the board, and it's, they serve at council's pleasure. And it's, the decision is completely up to council. Thank you. Councilman Foster, you brought this up. Uh, do you wish to comment? Yes, may I, I, I will make a comment. Um, the reason I brought it up because we have someone in that position and they hasn't, their term hasn't expired and they wish to continue to serve. Um, and then once the term expire, it's going to come back to council, um, and then we could choose someone for that position. Um, I think um, yes, they serve at the pleasure of the council. Everybody who serve on any board serves at the pleasure of the council. But you, but even though they serve at the pleasure of the council, you got a reason to remove someone for cause. Um, if we just remove someone to put someone else on there and we don't have cause like not showing up to meetings, not doing their job on the board, then we, we're setting a bad precedent. So, um, you know, I, I know you have a desire to serve on that. Um, um, I have a desire too, but I don't think I, I'm properly fitted to serve on that and I got my reasons for that. I'm not gonna go into that. But um, here right now, but um, I think we should leave it as it is, let the individual serve out his time and then, um, and then address it two years from now. Uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson. Yes, um, I, I do want to just quickly um, read, as a result, the city council may replace a resident member prior to the end of the ter member's term without having cause. Um, we, we don't need cause, but I'm fine with keeping him on to, and then re replacing him. Um, so j I'm fine with just letting him serve out his term, um, even though we don't need cause to remove him, so. Councilman Bailey. Uh, Mayor, um, yeah, I, I, I wanna address two things. Um, one is uh, the, I want to make sure it's clear that there are certain boards that are not necessarily at the pleasure of council. There are certain boards where you, there's statutory requirements for removal. Um, so there is differential between some boards, P and Z and Co being different from this. Um, so I do think it's different. Uh, the, the second thing is that um, I understand that Mr. Foster has um, expressed that the current, you know, the, our former mayor, um, wishes to continue. However, I have not heard that. Um, he has not contacted me. I don't know about the other members. Perhaps he has contacted Deputy Mayor and others but as well. But I, I, I have not been contacted, so I don't know that. I guess from, I, don't, I don't question that that is true, that he has expressed that intent to Mr. Foster, uh, but he has not expressed it to me, so therefore it would be kind of hard for me to consider keeping him. Uh, with the final point here, and I think my opinion is having served for um, six years uh, with, with uh, the incumbent, um, that we, we've always recognized that this is a resident position. I mean, we understand that it's a resident position in the code, but we've recognized that we've put a member of council on there. He had served on there for quite some time. And I think there's always a period, there's, there always comes a time when turnover is good. He served on there, I believe, starting when he was a council member, as well as eight years as mayor. Um, so that has given him experience, that is great. 
but we have term limits for our council members. We have, uh, you know, I think term limits being considered for some of our boards might be a good consideration in the future uh, as well, because I think building more human capital and more capital amongst this board with that issue would be important. So I don't think it would be, I don't think it should be seen as any type of adverse uh, action against uh, Mr. Capote to replace him with a council member. Um, and, and I don't, and I don't think, you know, I, I wouldn't think that he would feel that way either. I think it'd be appropriate for one of the council members to be, be on that board. And, and like I said, I know last meeting, I, I know I said that I expressed that I would like to be on there, um, you know, having, you know, an economic background, um, and, and, and certain experience on this board, I think would be helpful for that board. However, I also understand that the mayor expressed issue. So my preference would be to allow uh, our current mayor to to get on that board, or either myself, whichever is appropriate, um, and and move forward in that direction. And I don't think it should be, you know, it's normally these are routine things. I don't think this would normally ever be a discussion, to be honest with you. Um, and 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 that that's kind of my two cents on it. Thank you, Councilman Felix. Um, I would like uh, for Mrs. Smith, if you would bring that ordinance that specifically, can you read it for the record so we all understand? The ordinance for the pension? Um, Correct, okay. cover the. The, are you referring to section 55.04, the board of trustees? Correct, yes. The sole and exclusive administration at of and responsibility for the proper operation of the system and for making effect of the provisions of this subchapter is hereby vested in a board of trustees. The board is hereby designated as the plan administrator. The board shall consist of five trustees, two of whom, unless otherwise prohibited by law, shall be legal residents of the city who shall be appointed by the Palm Bay City Council one of whom shall be a police officer member of the system who shall be elected by a majority of the police officers who are members of the system, and one of whom shall be a firefighter member of the system who shall be elected by a majority of the firefighters who are members of the system. The fifth trustee shall be chosen by a majority of the previous four trustees as provided for herein, and such person's name shall be submitted to the Palm Bay City Council. Upon receipt of the fifth person's name, the Palm Bay City Council shall, as a ministerial duty, appoint such person to the Board of Trustees as its fifth trustee. The fifth trustee shall have the same rights as each of the other four trustees appointed or elected as herein, provided and shall serve a two-year term unless he sooner vacates the office. Each resident trustee shall serve as trustee for a period of two years unless he sooner vacates the office or is sooner replaced by the Palm Bay City Council at whose pleasure he shall serve. Each member trustee shall serve as trustee for a period of two, two years, unless he sooner leaves the employment of the city as a police officer or firefighter, or otherwise vacates his office as trustee, whereupon a successor shall be chosen in the same manner as originally. Each trustee may secede himself in office. The board shall establish and administer the nominating and electing election procedures for each election. The board shall meet at least quarterly each year. The board shall be a legal entity with, in addition to other powers and responsibilities contained herein, the power to bring and defend lawsuits of every kind, nature, and description. Thank you so much. Um, I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to make here, uh, Councilman Bailey did mention it. Um, you're obviously fully aware of the, of the uh, uh, ordinance um, as far as uh, the two position as resident of the city. Um, I don't think in no where in the ordinance where it says it must be a council member part of that board in that particular, those two seats. Well, I do understand as well, we are resident of the city. So um, with that being said, I mean, I would, if we're gonna uphold or, you know, follow ordinance, I think Former Mayor Capote should remain until this story is up, um, 2022, and uh, then at that point, council may appoint another resident of the city. That, that just what I just wanted clarification as far as I have a better understanding of, of what the 
and, and, and Mayor, I do understand you express and clearly express interest of wanting to serve. I mean, no disrespect to your request, but uh, to me, I think we shall li leave it alone. And should we uh, take a vote tonight? I think we should go ahead and do that and, and move forward. Okay. So uh, I have a, a few points I, I'd like to make. The first is, uh, the community has hired a mayor that's willing to serve this community fervently. That's the first point I, I'd like to make. And sitting on this board has led and been, there's been a precedence in this board. Previous mayor, uh, John Maziotti sat on this board prior to Mayor uh, William Capote. That, that was the, tra the transition when uh, John Maziotti was not reelected, Mayor Capote picked up the baton at that point and passed it on. So there is precedence of us continuing that tradition. That being said, uh, we all know, as our uh, Councilman Bailey mentioned, uh, there are term limits. And in term limits, we're holding to that, each and every one of us up here. When either we're termed out or we're not elected again, we step down and there are ordinance in place that state I, we cannot go work for the city of Palm Bay. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for term limits. We can't go lobby this board if once our term is over because there's a reason for that. It's in our ordinance. So, council, I am willing to serve in this capacity. I'd also like to state that we should work towards, and I, I'd like to, to work with Ms. Uh, Smith, because in my opinion, this is a loophole. This is a loophole because if we're not allowed to go work for the city for X amount of years because we served on this board, there's a reason for that. So there should be the same ordinance applies. I'm willing to serve on this board as your mayor, as each and every one of us knows. And that's where it lies. There's a reason for us, and, and we're subject to this. We're literally subject to this. Four years from now, we don't know if we're not gonna be on this board anymore. We certainly can't. We have to cut ties at that point. So that is, uh, the essence of my willingness to serve, this is a, a new day. I've shared with you my concerns and perhaps working towards uh, fixing this loophole and, and maybe adding that this board, as uh, Councilman Bailey says, we, we say that, hey, a member of council should serve. And perhaps either the mayor or the deputy mayor could be specifically made uh, a point of that if they so choose and then pass that on if, if they're not willing to serve. Mayor. Yes, sir. I, I definitely see what you mean in regards to a, a loophole and I don't know if it's something uh, yourself or Councilman Bailey will want to pick up and work with um, staff or Mrs. Smith, but um, I'm, I'm you know, in, in this point in time, I'm, I'm still on just letting them finish out, but to make sure something like this doesn't occur again, um, I don't know if it's you or Councilman Bailey who will want to pick up, pick up for that, but um, I, I agree with that as well, so. Can I, Mayor, Mayor? Um, I, I understand you, you just, I'm commenting off what you said. I'm not trying to get in a debate with you. I'm just commenting off what you said, where I respectfully disagree. Um, 
when you talked about from one mayor, from Maggiotti to Capote, um, you was right in that sense. They both served on this um, 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 police um, pension board. Um, but Mr. Capote term has not expired. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to get you to see. His term is not as expired. There's two people, there's two residents on that board that we could re replace, Mr. Capote and another gentleman. But we're just talking about Mr. Capote. And his term is not expired. And the other gentleman who served on that, I would be saying the same thing about him if he was talking about his term, because his term's not expired. And uh, you could, I don't, I don't know if uh, Terry has the, the term, but I talked to Mr. Capote um, and he wants to serve on it. And I don't understand why Jeff Belly don't believe me when I say he wants to serve. I wouldn't sit up here and lie that a person came to me. I have a lot of people come to me want to serve on the board. I'm just not going to replace them because uh, they want to serve. Uh, replace somebody else and put them on because they want to serve. That person have to ride out they, they term. And that's the president I don't want to set here to remove someone because someone else wants to serve in that place. Yeah, I understand you want to serve, and I have my reason why I don't want to serve. Okay? You have your reason why you want to serve. And I understand that. But I don't think we need to take people off a board because the term is not expired. And we don't have cars for that. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? Yeah, I, I sent an email um, asking staff. I was just curious. When was the appointment, the reappointment date, and what's the? I guess what's the term? What's the current term? And, and while they looked that up real quick, Mayor, just real quick, Mr. Foster um, seemed to have interpreted that the that, that I was questioning whether it was true. That, that I was trying to make clear that that's not what I was questioning. What I do take a little bit of issue is that, you no, know, if he contacted one member, not the whole board, then, you know, it's we're kind of doing a routine thing. If you want to change what the routine thing is, which is usually we have a council member on there, and at some time I believe we've had two council members in both positions historically, which I actually think maybe that's what we need to go back to. I wouldn't have a problem you know, removing both of them and having both the mayor and a member of council on there at this time. That might be a more appropriate uh, move to go back to that tradition. But um, it certainly wasn't, you no, know, there wasn't an integrity issue there. It was just more of a fact that, look, if, if he hasn't come to ask me that, and to me this is a routine thing, why would not I do the routine thing? I mean, if he asked me and we had a conversation further, then maybe there would be something to persuade me, but there wasn't. That, that was my only point, Mayor. But no, can I make a point, sir? Up to the mayor. I, I'm done other than I was asking a question for Ms. Leffler. Okay. The, the term is set to expire March 31st of 22, and it's a two-year term, so it looks as though he was probably appointed on April 1st of 20. Okay, yeah, so that was so this one was like an off-basis thing. But just the fact that staff put this on, our, it's, it's something that normally we would review. I mean, I don't think that it was put on there with any type of intention, as far as I know. I, I, mean, I guess, I guess I don't know. There could, I don't know if somebody asked behind the scenes to put it on there, but as far as I, I looked at it, I just looked at it as routine. And um, but there's something I don't know. I don't know. Any other discussion? I won't be supporting this uh, for this, the reasons I stated. Um, Councilman Bailey, would you consider uh, working with uh, Ms. Smith regarding solidifying uh, the future? Or would you want, you prefer that I You want I me to bring that? back term limit, uh, term limit provision? Yeah. yeah, I have no problem with that. Okay. Uh, uh, Mayor. Carry on, so Council. Would we, uh, what are we talking about? Working with Ms. With Smith in regards of working on the wording of the ordinance, would that need to be addressed as well? Because it's clearly stated to, to citizen in, that, in those yeah, positions. Yeah, to, to so making, making it a council member. Okay, so the, yeah. the wording, making the verbiage. A, either the, the mayor or, or the deputy mayor. If the mayor can't fulfill that, then perhaps the deputy mayor. Okay. Um, so, I mean, yes, sir. I, I, I get 
and as you, you clearly stated, stated that there's a precedent, and, and I, I understand it. I personally, as a council member, I, I don't, I'm not seeing the necessity as one of us must serve. Because what I'm looking at as well, would it be somewhat conflicting? Because we are, we, we playing both sides. Because the, that board, particular board, make decision as to, you know, pension and so on, that council have a say. Is, am, I, am I correct? Would have to come be, please, please enlighten me, someone? Because he, once that board make recommendation in terms of negotiation uh, recommendation with with uh, with the union on on is it not council may I have say mayor if I may or well let's staff answer or, uh, that no Mr. that's just a question may you know make it oh. clear to me because what I'm seeing is uh, my understanding of of it and you know forget forgive my ignorance uh, are you um, asking our staff uh, no, Miss Patricia. Okay. Well, M Councilman Bailey, you certainly can uh, chime in if you want, but uh, Mrs. Smith. Okay, I, I will. Ms. Smith can pick up the pieces, but no, they're not making recommendations on bargaining. Um, and quite frankly, they don't I mean they, they give us a report, but they're, they're monitoring the fund, and there are some other, uh, or some other duties they have as far as making rulings with people who are retirees, um, and they're, they're obviously picking their financial advisor. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's anything. They're not. A, they're not an advisory board as other boards are. Okay. But um, and I'll, I'll let Miss Smith add. Or that's correct. Oh, yeah. Usually they're not dealing with the collective bargaining. Um, what they're dealing with, there may be um, issues that come up with as far as uh, employees' pension, whether you know, the issues what's compensable, where they are, those type of things. Okay. And, and eligibility things, yeah. Okay. And, and and forgive me, I don't know if staff has the answer, but because I because I, I would be doing just off the top of my head, and it might be conjecture. But I believe in the past, normally what would happen in this situation is the member of council who is leaving would just resign. I mean, they wouldn't there wouldn't be a I want to stay on. There would be, okay, I've, I've, I'm I'm moving on, so I'm moving on that position to allow the next person to do it. Is, is there any history that we have on that? Did, did that happen, like, for instance, with, I don't know, Mayor Mazziotti? It looks like he might have left before his end of term actually happened. But I think in the past, they, they just left. It wasn't ever, I don't think it was ever a question. And forgive me, and we might not get that answer tonight. It might not solve it, uh, Mayor. But, you know, like I said, I, to me, it just... It just makes sense that we would appoint a member of council. I think having one of us there, having eyes on that fund, um, one of us there to have um, direct access and and staying um, abreast of the the actuary reports and the financial position. I mean, we're going to get it, and you can always ask staff. You can always go to their. I mean, their board meetings are open to the public, so I presume we can watch. We just can't comment because there's a, especially if there's a council member on the on the board at the time, but. Um, I mean, there's, there's ways of keeping in touch, but it's different when you're on the board and that's your job, you know? So I, I still feel that it's really important for one of us to be on there, if not, like I said, two of us. I mean, maybe not having, forcing it to be two, maybe having, but we certainly have the flexibility because we're all residents, so we can always point to it. It has happened. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why it fell away from that. I think I remember getting an explanation from some board members previously about how it went from two to now we have none, <laughs> you know, at this, at the, right, this, this particular time and, and uh, moment. Thank you. Any further discussion? Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's, we don't even need to make a motion at this point. Uh, is that correct, Ms. Smith? Yes, you would only be making a motion if you were um, seeking to make change. But if you were uh, just maintaining the status quo, no, there would be no motion uh, needed to be made. Well, I mean, I, I would make the motion to appoint Mayor Medina to the to the board. I don't know where that's going to go, but well, at this point, I can't even pass the gavel because the deputy mayor's not here. Oh, hey, I didn't realize he left. So to second that motion, but if, if n none of the current members are going to second it, the deputy mayor made clear where his position yeah. was. I guess so. It dies without uh, a second. Uh, my, I did state for the record my thoughts about this so we're moving on council reports councilman felix um i don't really have a whole lot except you know just want to wish everybody a happy new year we didn't get a chance to do that last meeting uh, 
Um, happy New Year, and and we actually, uh, I wish uh, you know the 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 best, the best of the best uh, to the city of Palm Bay. Um, we have a great mix up here that willing and, and ready to work for the city. Um, we have a uh, stellar staff um, that is committed. Um, so I wish the city um, the best and, and all citizens definitely de de deserve the best of us. So um, with that. Thank you, Councilman Felix. Councilman Foster. Um, I'd like to say to Palm Bay, Happy New Year. We had a lot of stuff going on in the month of December. A homicide, shootings, and some crazy stuff going on. And um, I just pray for the families of the victims. Um, also today, I had a chance to um, attend the police department um, award ceremony. And I found that uh, very educating and learning a lot what our men and women do for us. Um, uh, the chief put on a good uh, presentation of awards and recognition of the police officers that work for him. Um, also, I want to let the council know I'm going to be at um, Mayor Jake Williams' funeral tomorrow. He, he was a good man. He was an Air Force veteran. He passed away uh, with a heart attack in his home with his... Um, I think he was uh, with his um, uh, grandkid. She was like seven years old, who called 911, and her uh, grandfather lay there dead. But he was a good, he, he served our community, he served our country, and I, I want to go and recognize him for that. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilman Felix wanted to take another round that reports. Hey, I, I wanted to add, I, I forgot to uh, mention that, wanting to, uh, what do you say, thank you to uh, uh, Philip Weinberg. Mr. Philip Weinberg has been a great, uh, you know, community uh, servant. Um, I want to reappoint him to the Citizen Advisory uh, Committee. Which one? The county, the, the T TPO, it's, it's, yeah. So I just wanted to add that to mention. Copy that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Philip, for your heart of serving. You serve this community very well. Mr. Bailey. Um, thank you, Mayor. And, and just real briefly, I am that wasn't on there. I didn't realize that it was tomorrow. But Mr. Foster, do pass my uh, condolences and you know, hopefully for off council tomorrow. I think Mr. Williams was uh, respected. I wouldn't say that I'd call him a close friend and more of an acquaintance. But I, but obviously we run in circles, and I know that his reputation. You know, sometimes the people who um, who buck the trend, sometimes they get in trouble. You know, I know he he unfortunately lost, or he lost his last election, but he certainly had a couple. He had success up there, and I know that he. He served to try to do the right thing, and, and I can appreciate that, um, and I appreciate what he did from afar. Um, so please do pass our condolences. Um, uh, really quick housekeeping, I would like to appoint uh, James Boothroyd uh, to the Planning and Zoning Committee. I will be removing him from my uh, position on the Community Budget Advisory Board, and I will be appointing Pete Filiberto to that board. And then for the Infrastructure Advisory Board, I'm going to be appointing uh, Thomas Gom. The next piece of business that I wanted to address real quick, um, you know, per our council rules and procedures, I wanted to give uh, notification to council of my intent to work with staff to bring back an uh, ordinance change. This ordinance change, it was uh, previously section one, uh, chapter 185.203. Uh, it has to do with some of our rezoning uh, conditions, and, and there was a petition process in there previously um, that I want to work on. That was what, what it does is essentially requires a supermajority if a certain amount of residents, uh, residential folks around there, uh, that, that site uh, sign a petition. So that's why I'm going to work with staff to, to bring that back. should be pretty simple. I've kind of... Um, you now started laying some of the legwork, but before I can bring it back on the agenda, I need to let you guys know. So just so you know, that will be coming forward um, uh, in the future. 
Uh, it was something that was uh, done once with the Plantation Circle folks. So if you want more information on it, you can contact uh, Mr. Smith and some of our residents down there who who, uh, who contacted me and asked me to consider this. And, I, and I'll have more on it when the time comes. I actually had voted to rescind this in the past, but I think reconsideration that sometimes having certain um, certain uh, layers of protections for folks and adding more um, scrutiny to items can be a good thing. And certainly I've, I've pushed out at, at times for different items on council. And so anyhow, that's why I'll be bringing that back. It might be a little bit different from our previous version, um, but it will, but I'm hoping that council will support it. Um, lastly, I'm hoping, and I, I don't know if, um, I don't know if the uh, you know, city manager, I didn't ask her to prepare anything, but if she would like to comment, I certainly you know, would be happy to hear from her. I've been uh, you know, constantly talking Republic. Hopefully council has, I know Deputy Mayor was already here, but hopefully all our three new members you know, kind of got up to speed on that. I have to keep my uh, contract handy as I get questions from citizens, but there are some um, you know, outstanding issues out there, but I wanna make, make sure that we are holding them accountable with any liquidated damages, that we see that as quickly as possible. I'm hoping to maybe discuss that more at the next meeting. Um, and that we also just oversee this process. Right now we have folks who are gonna be seeing uh, Republic come through and take out their garbage carts. Um, if you have two or more, they should have you on a list and you should be getting a 96 gallon or 95 gallon, I keep forgetting which if it's 96, 95, but, um, but the larger cart size replaced. Um, I have heard that I, I am aware of it, if it, that it is happening, that they are, they have started the process. Um, I had one folks, they said that they actually went up to the yard to get it because I was concerned. I was talking to Ms. Sherman this week that were folks supposed to bring down both carts, even if they're empty every yeah, single, yeah. you know, it, twice a week until it happens because I feel like there could have been better notification. They should have, they should know where these multiple cart sites are and be able to kind of say, hey, at least tell us next week, if not this, no, sometime this week. So um, I just want to make sure we're keeping a close eye on that and that we hold them accountable. We have, we, I think we're going to have a healthier long-term relationship if we set the right tone of accountability early. And I think our residents will be, uh, be better, uh, best served by that too, um, moving forward. That, and that is all of my items tonight, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Bailey. Uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, like everybody said, I hope everybody had a, um, a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Good to see everybody back here in 2021. Um, my uh, prayers, I'll, I'll be there as well for a Mayor Jake, former Mayor Jake Williams' uh, funeral as well. Um, other than that, um, pray for this nation. Pray for this nation during this time of transition. Um, before I came to this council meeting, I saw uh, one of the Capitol officers in D.C., um, passed away so we we're we're going through a, a time right now of transitioning and whether you're leaning one way or another we're all Americans and we need to act like it all right we don't need the rest of the world laughing at us you know because we don't know how to conduct ourselves and conduct ourselves civilly so definitely you know treat treat others the way you want to be treated love your neighbor as you love yourself and let's move forward and let, um, Reverend Spellman said it earlier, let's let the light shine on Palm Bay. Let's show the rest of the nation how it's supposed to be done. So other than that, that's all, Mayor. Well, thank you. I'm, I am all about shining light here in Palm Bay. And, and uh, part of that, I'm, I'm excited about uh, a few weeks ago, I shared with this council that uh, my intentions of creating, designing, a challenge coin as a, as a form of rewarding our outstanding citizens and our outstanding employees. And, and uh, just to report to you, Council, you know what? I think I may have one in my pocket because you never know when I may need one. So I just wanted to share that I have, this program has uh, now been in place. Uh, uh, the first recipient of that challenge coin was none other than our chief uh, of Police Chief Moya for his outstanding achievement uh, where he was recognized by the Florida Today. Uh, and then I've also was able to provide uh, one of our standing uh, employees, Keeley, as well. So I'm, I'm really excited about bringing something positive to our community, uh, recognizing 
uh, our employees and recognizing our citizens. And, and not for nothing, if you, if you look at our citizenry and the, the level of engagement, I'd love to see more of that. And this is what I hope to bring in, in that message. This is what I hope to have. Uh, one of the recipients definitely will be Chief Batten for his countless hours of dedication uh, to this city as a civilian. And I, I, there's no, no other civilian that has actually uh, proven himself so worthy as he. He's countless hours of studying the issues. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll forever be grateful. Um, as a resident, before I became an elected official, um, I, I've witnessed his desire to serve this community. And he should be recommended or commended for that. Uh, that is all I had to report. Moving on to new business, uh, I'm going to defer to Ms. Smith. Resolution 2021-03, a resolution of the City of Palm Bay, Bavaro County, Florida, amending res resolution 2011-34 by updating the City of Palm Bay fund balance policy, providing for an effective date. Ms. Sherman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a, um, a proposed, two proposed significant uh, primary changes to our um, current resolution that established the city's fund balance policy. It was last changed in 2011. Um, here in the audience with, with me to expound on the issues as needed is uh, our finance director, Yvonne McDonald, as well as a representative from our public resources advisory group, which is our um, financial advisory firm who did help us on this policy. Just to briefly go into the two items that are being proposed. Item number one is a change to our current minimum unrestricted fund balance, which is currently um, established as 10% of the subsequent fiscal year's budgeted expenditures, less capital outlay and transfers. We are proposing that that increases from 10% to 17%, which is uh, go going to be in accordance with the Government Finance Officers Association recommended a best practice for establishing uh, those fund balance uh, minimums. The second proposed change is to, um, there is in the, currently in the, um, the resolution in the policy, there is a, what's called a stabilization re reserve um, uh, recommendation, which states basically a council may set aside between five to 7% of the uh, fund balance as essentially an emergency reserve. The proposed change is to, take that out and replace it with uh, the fact that we would, not, not a May issue, but we would establish an emergency fund um, with a, pun, a fund balance of between two and three million dollars. So those are the two recommendations. I've, I've briefed each of you individually about those issues and you know, staff is here to talk through those and see where you're comfortable with in terms of you know, any, any changes or no changes. Um, completely up to you all, so thank you. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards on this item? No, sir. I'd like a motion. <coughs> Mayor, I, I want to make a motion to yes. uh, so we can get discussion started, but I do yes. have some comments. I'll make a motion to approve. Second There's for discussion. Yeah, M Mayor, um, I appreciate what Ms. Sherman and staff has brought forth uh, for us. I think that it was important for us to be more conservative in our savings and keeping our balance for our long-term uh, credit health and just our long-term fiscal health, and being able to uh, deal with, with emergencies and problems in the future. The, when I reviewed it, because I had some discussions about this last year with Ms. Sherman and, and, uh, and, and, and previous staff as well, um, about you know, looking at you know, what type of changes we can make or what's, the, what's a healthy way of doing it. I was thinking 15% at the time. Uh, I know further studies show that seven, or the two months, which is approximately 16.7 or 17%, um, was a, a, you know, a higher threshold that, that could be or should be um, uh, achieved. I did want council to consider, um, after I reviewed the policy, I know there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like verbiage and things like that. I mean, I don't want to touch any of that stuff. But when it came to the fund balance, what I was concerned about is that if we go, if we go to 17 plus to two to three million, you know, we're, it, it's a pretty, I mean, it's, it's a good goal, but I think it's also, I don't want to be in a position where we, we would fall below that. And I, cause I think falling below that wouldn't be the end of the world either. So m what I wanted to suggest is that instead of we having a nominal number 
the two to three million, which would be uh, fixed, you know, nominal, would not change, leaving a percentage in there, but changing that five to seven percent to a we will do it because that's been the issue. We the policy says that we may do it, and it just never came up. Okay, um, in the past, and certainly we we are there today. Today we 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 would meet that. We just have not officially said this is our our stabilization stabilization fund. Um, I don't believe so. Anyhow, I think that that's something that we can do, and so that we will do that. So it can fluctuate between that five to seven. It gives us a a buffer, and then change the minimum unrestricted from instead of from ten to seventeen, bring it ten to twelve. So those two combined will put us in that 17 to 19 percent range, which I think would be keep us in a healthy place. So I at least wanted to offer that because I think it brings financial stability while also offering a bit of flexibility so that we're never accused of being below our policy uh, if there was an emergency because we'd have some flexibility there. And, and it would grow with time as our budget has grown. We, we've in just four or five years, my, my first four, I think it was my first four or five years, there was a 25 percent increase in general fund. I mean, huge. So therefore, that would account for that. So I, so I like that percentage better than the nominal number. So what you're saying is it, it'll, it'll open us up instead of restricting us. If we just go out like 17%, mm. you're talking about 12% in that and then just... Yeah, because then the 5 to 7 and the whether we continue to call it stabilization or we call it emergency fund, that would bring it up to that. It would still be in that same now. fund. We would still be meeting that same policy objective of having it there. It's just that we now we're free to spend some of that whenever the hurricane hits. Or I wanted to make sure that emergencies, I know in, right now it says the sole discretion of the city manager to, to ascertain what the, what the emergency would be. Um, know that we would have that, that ability still to go and meet those challenges. And I want to make sure it includes infrastructure. If we had a pipe collapse, for instance, or uh, God forbid that you know, Malabar Road caves in, that we can go in there quickly and handle it. But the other thing, and, and I had pointed out to Ms. Sherman, I don't think it was necessarily their intent, but the when I read it, um, you know, it says city manager in, their, in her sole discretion. I want to make sure we're not saying she can go spend two, or he or her can go spend, um, you no, know, two to three million dollars without, didn't tell us later about it. Uh, obviously, if something needs to be fixed now, you fix it. But uh, I think that the idea would be there. If we, we had a hurricane, you can bring it, and it's going to cost us that much to do something immediately. You can bring us together for a special council meeting in 24 hours. Okay. And I don't think it was her intent to say that they're going to have, because our policy in procurement is 100,000. Right. So I want to make sure that those are consistent as well. But that's, but that's more of a, um, that's more, I don't think that there's in, any difference in intent. But, and I don't think there's really a lot of difference in intent. What I'm suggesting maybe is an alternate uh, way of doing the policy either. But I just want to at least bring it up for discussion. I told Ms. Sherman I was. I don't think she was so, highly resistant to that. So Ms. Sherman, may I ask, uh, do you find that this will be less restrictive and, and still achieving our goal of those set-asides? Uh, um, well, I find that it's it's actually going to it, it's so part of our goal in coming into this just from a staff standpoint was to to show another step toward setting more money aside, right? right. To hold that to show that we're we're being good good stewards of our, our fund balance that's currently unassigned. So right now, all we have that is a mandatory set aside is that ten percent number, and so any any change you make that gets us above that, I think shows that we are increasing our attention to that and trying to make sure that it is held and not spent on things other than in the case of you know as we just discussed maybe emergencies things like that so if if you choose to do a you know as as councilman bailey was laying out a 10 to 12 percent for the uh, the basic minimum and then instead of a may stabilization fund a shall do between five and seven percent either way that moves us into a instead of a 10 percent we're being the 15 to 19 percent range which is more than where we've been now. The, the only caution, I've mentioned this to each of you, is the, the more we put into the box, it just, it, it holds it. Um, so that's the, the flip side is, you know, you, you obviously don't want to paint yourself too far into a corner where you've locked up all your, your money and you can't use it for something. I think emergencies are the biggest thing you're going to want to use it for anyway. And it just for the record, as we talked about, when you look at where we ended 2020, just using round numbers, we had about $17 million that would be available for unassigned uh, general fund reserves. If you were to do um, the 17% minimum that we talked about, that would, right off of that 17, take $11 million right off of that. If you took another $3 million for an emergency fund, which was you know the proposal there, that would really only leave you with a little over $2 million that's, that's just there. And 
I say that just to point out that our um, our fund balance, while it's absolutely healthier than it was, uh, you know, in more recent years, we're, we're we're moving in a very good direction from that standpoint. We're certainly not in a place where I would say we've got all kinds of reserves. We're doing great. You know, don't worry about it because if you look at it, 17 percent is simply two months worth of our operating costs. If suddenly there was no money coming in and we just had to cover, um, you know, operations and personnel and things, so. That was a long answer to your question, I guess, but yes. anything so, that puts us in a place where we are um, showing our, our citizens, but also showing our auditors, showing our the folks that look at our finances. We just went through the, the Fitch and S&P rating review, showing them that we, are, um, ca we care about what we are holding and what we're doing with that. I think any step in that direction to increase the 10% is positive. The reason we highlighted that 17% number was because that is the government finance officer's um, recommendation, but again, it's just a number, so. So we can still go with the 12 and then shall five yep. and, and achieve the same goal. You absolutely can, and the other thing I would say too is this is a resolution, so you could, sh you could make that change today and you could change it again tomorrow kind of, kind of thing, you know, so you have that flexibility built in. Mm -hmm. Council? Any Council, she answered my question. Okay. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I like to say something. Um, I'm more in, inclined to going with the 17. percent um, It's the Government Finance Officer Association recommendation. They're the, they're the professionals in this. Um, two months in reserves is to me too low, but I'm willing to live with that. Um, I like what the uh, the staff came up with the 17 percent, and I think we should stick with that. Um, and it set a will. We should we shouldn't lock us up in a corner with the word will. Um, I mean, shall it should be may may. I like that more than shall or will, because then you you put yourself in a in a, in a corner and you can't get out. So. Um, I'm I'm for going with the 17 percent and having more, having three million in the reserve, three million in the reserve. Deputy Mayor Johnson, um, I, I, I second it, um, and I didn't know what Councilman Bailey was going to mention, but I was I was fine with it as is because of the recommendations um, from the GFOA. Um, I'm I'm listening to hear rest. I'm looking to hear from the rest of council, but I'm fine with it as is. I appreciate Councilman Bay look, looking at other options, but um, Councilman Foster kind of said it best. The, these are the professionals, and they know the guidelines, similar to like with um, the removing of uh, permits for sheds. You know, we leaned on the professionals of that association for that. So I'm fine with uh, following this as is. Councilman Felix. Um, yeah, that would be the case for me as well. I mean, I, I would be leaning towards uh, the staff recommendation um, because th there is, you know, standard already. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, us being at 10% was not an issue in terms of, uh, you know, getting us in trouble. But e every time, as uh, Ms. Sherman mentioned, you're making progress, increasing your, 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 your fund, you know, you're increasing that, 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 that percentage, it's making us step in a good, uh, right direction. Quick question to Councilman Bailey, though. Um, you, you agree to, you obviously, you're, you're, what you're proposing, it's, it's really achieving the same thing. Just wanting to understand your, your thought yeah, process on that. It, which, yeah, forgive me because I know that I, it's it's this is this was a the reading through this is you know it's I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of expecting you guys to be like right there with me. And I understand it's it's probably a little bit more difficult than that. Let me let me address two. Let me address one thing real quick. I know Mr. Foster was talking about the May and Shall and trying to understand that. Ms. Sherman and I agreed that the current language was was May and it was we weren't doing it. We were likely not to. Uh, times got tough at a point in time and then we just never got back around to it, which is you know, part of that whole idea of last year when I was asking about, like I wanted this, this policy to come forward and for us to improve it. The May, right now it says May, we wanna change it to will. Um, the language for the two pieces that we're changing are shall and will. If I just, I just checked them real quick. I think one is shall and one is will. We shall have the 17%, I believe, or the two months. 
16.7%. I hate saying 17. I don't know. For some reason, I want to be more precise. But uh, but we, we will have those two months. That's a shall. And we will have the 2 to $3 million. That's exact, that, that language is exactly the same as what I'm saying propose. The difference is that the money that we're putting in, into because they're all going in the same pot they're already it's already in the kitty right and it's already in unrestricted right the second we have more than enough to cover either policy change um it's sitting right there the difference is how we're, we're describing it i don't want it to be where we have a four million dollar problem we have two million in the bank for the emergency fund which is we made which is we will do we will have at least two so if we have two in there let's say at some point and we have a four million dollar problem we're going to take two million out and if we're only at 17 percent, we're going to fall below it and i just don't want it to be looked upon us as though well look they're going below their their own minimum that they set for themselves they said they shall do this and they're not doing it that was my concern i don't know that and so so the way that i've written it out it's still going to be between 17 19 percent Two to three million today. I was just trying to do the quick math on it. I want to say that's around three or four percent. So that'd be put us around 2021. So that'd be just slightly lower than what that is. And of course, we could still do a percentage. I like the percentage because percentage grows with time and costs grow with time. We know that inflation grows with time. So therefore, you know, we don't have to review this no, the end of this year or next year, it's already going to be growing with the fund. So at the bare minimum, maybe the, the percentages aren't right, but I still think that, that there's, there's some wisdom in, in having it as a percentage as opposed to a fixed number. Uh, so I don't know if that helped a little bit yeah. in, in catching it up and also some of the nuance as far as the legal the, the language that we're using. And that's where I say, well, I don't want to put it, like I said, I don't want to put a position where we, we have to exceed it. We go below 17%. Well, if we say that we're, we have 17% there to set aside between emergency and our, and our minimum unrestricted, and we end up using some of it, we have that cushion. No, it's 5 to 7%, which is greater than what we're putting in emergency right now. We haven't violated our policy, and it grows with time. So those, that, that's, I don't know, that, that's, that's where, um, oh, I'll shut up. I know I'm over-explaining now. <laughs> so, so the, <laughs> no, no, I see the logic. Yeah. I, I mean... It makes sense. Uh, I mean, essentially, we may end up more than 17% plus 3 million. So uh, as it grows, with, with your logic, we may end up exceeding that, possibly, with time. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, that, that answer, I just wanted to understand. I know you were going somewhere with it. I just wanted to make sure I'm clear. <laughs> and, and I guess we all saying the same thing to achieve the same thing. Well, what, what's being proposed versus what you're saying. So, yeah, I, I, I get it. And I would support that as well. Listen, yeah. what I'm hearing is 17% is, is good uh, from the council. Uh, Councilman Bailey is uh, really motivated and encouraged uh, about even going further in the future if, if we're, not, we're not there yet. Um, but right now, everyone here is in agreement that 17%. So in an effort not to muddy the waters anymore, Councilman Bailey, <laughs> um, you're, you're good with the motion as, as is. Well, no. Well, I wanted to, us to have a discussion. What I would like to see, because if, if we say we shall have 17%, and we have emergency bigger than what we set aside for our emergency fund, and we don't have excess unrestricted, we will fall below our policy. Oh, can I? Can I interject? I'll, I mean, maybe Ms. Sherman can help me out here. So is, uh, let me restate it. So you're, what you're saying is if we, um, if we don't have anything beyond the 17% set aside mm -hmm. below that for emergencies or for anything, and we have an emergency, you'd be dipping into the 17%? I, I Correct, and we would be violating our policy. So if we, we only have two million in our emergency, we have something more than two million, mm -hmm. more than three, if we have three and something more than three, we'd be dipping below our policy at that point in time. And the second thing being that, look, five years from now, two to three million dollars will not be the same percentage. It will be, right now, my, the policy as I propose it, which could be, I mean, I wouldn't be, you know, maybe we should go a little bit higher. Maybe it should be 15 and then make the emergency a different number. But I think having the emergency as a percentage is important because two to three million dollars five years from now is not the same as today. The future value of that dollar is not the same, but if we make it a percentage, it will grow. So, so no, five years from now, we would actually have less than my policy. 
or the policy that I'm proposing. But right now it might be right now mine might be slightly less, but in five years from now mine would be actually more without so was being it twelve without being and then five for emergency. Is that yes? Where but it'd still be at? it'd be seventeen total. Right. And I was saying and five, five to seven because I guess I was saying five to seven because it was already in there that way. Right. But the problem is we didn't have it as a we will do it. We had it as we may do it, do it, which is a issue that. Derp that the staff's policy also addresses by so making sure it, uh, it. It, it, it's a will and a shall for those two okay. issues. So she, they addressed it as well. I think we're in agreement on that. Okay. We've got other council members that wish to, yeah. to jive in. Uh, Deputy Mayor Johnson, were you before uh, council? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to have the finest, see if we can get the finance director to come up and sure. chime in. Um, Ms. McDonald. Sure. You I, see her, I see her wheels turning too. Her wheels turning. She, so? She's going. She's going to correct oh, anything I said wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she'll be agreement. I don't know. Welcome, Miss McDonald. Thank you. Basically, uh, I guess I want to say is we're looking at the minimum fund balance requirement. I understand what you're saying for is doing ten to twelve percent, but this is. It's less than two months of operating, so that's th that's one thing. The other I issue was the five percent for the stabilization. You're saying, okay, we started at five percent. That means right now, at uh, using t uh, 21's numbers, we'll be putting in over three million at this point for the, for that. So it's really what you guys want to do, but. Um, but most we, we we did do surveys of some of the different cities. Most do usually do about the uh, the FGFAs recommended uh, seventeen percent. Most of them did. Some are higher. But here again, like I said, it depends on the city. It's like it's just like each you have two different three different households. Each has their own budget and stuff. So. Because one city can put away more, meet the GFOA's minimum requirement, doesn't mean that the other city can. But so, but like I just just want to point out, looking at five percent for that stabilization, we would be looking at more than three million right now. So what you're saying, and the other thing to point out, even if we fell be, below our minimum required, the policy addresses that we have, we can't, we can set a process in place to bring it back up to that. You can also, at any point in time, council can elect to actually lower your minimum fund balance if we got into a situation or mm -hmm. the economy all tanked and stuff like that. But by doing it now while we have the funds, it stays there and it kind of takes away a lot of excess money that's sitting there, that there's that temptation Genius. that people say it's there. I, I like to say it's kind of like having the jelly beans in the jar. The more jelly beans you see, the more temptation is to keep going back to that jelly bean, and it's harder to say no to the person asking to get <laughs> those jelly beans out of the jar. So that was why we recommended the higher uh, minimum required fund balance. And like I said, the starting out, the reason for the uh, three thousand three million we had set for the emergency because we we're kind of looking at what it cost us to do for like the sanitation till we got reimbursement from FEMA and stuff like that. So if you don't want to do the three million, you could do two, start off with two million. And so it's really just a matter of what you want to do. But being on more on the conservative side myself, I like the idea that putting the minimum fund balance a little higher. Okay, and, and let me just real quick, I understand the five to seven percent, that's higher. Mm -hmm. And then the minimum, with the minimum fund balance being, or unrestricted fund balance being a little bit lower. And in totality, I think that the proposal I have on the table would be slightly less, but over time would probably be more because that nominal dollar is going to lose value at time. Unless, I mean, we're, of course, we can have a huge recession and mm -hmm. that could change things too. But of course, we could also see our emergency fund reflect with that with a right. percentage. Let me ask this, because I, 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 one thing that you're, you're absolutely right, and that's, you know, like I told Ms. Sherman, and I was saying before, we, we want to put that money aside. We, we, I don't want us to be tempted to say we've got $27 million sitting here. Let's go spend it all. We only need you know, 10, 10 of it so for our fund balance, so let's go spend 10. And, you know, I absolutely, I'm, that's, I think we're all in agreement on that. Um, but let me ask you this. What about the emergency funds for these other places? Because basically I'm trying to, that, that emergency fund does put, 
extra money aside in the unrestricted fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, so which is the same aim as the minimum, or it's not, it's, which is similar to the minimum fund balance. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the same, it's, it's in the all, same place. It's all basically, you just take, basically yeah. take it all out of one pot and putting it in smaller pots. So I'm just labeling it different. Yeah. yeah. So, so the one part I'm trying to make bigger for emergencies and a little bit smaller for the minimum. Uh, how do other agent do other agency how do other other agencies um i know we did a review of the minimum fund balance what about the emergency funds and like i say here again it would depend um, roof did an analysis a lot of it's very difficult to find because so you have to kind of dig through it to try and, and some cities have it but some also some cities if they have a 25 percent minimum fund balance they don't may not have those other little pots like that so here again it all keeps coming back to basically what the city wants to do and knowing what your circumstances are. How would, and let, let me make this pro. So I really think that there should be more in the emergency side and a little bit less on the minimum, but if councils, you know, if everybody wants to you know, feels comfortable at 17 or to two months, I'm good with that. I don't, I ultimately, I want that there. Cause the mer to me, I see that emergency set aside. I mean, are how many, how many hurricanes do we really have where we have to hit those things? I mean, over 10 years, maybe two, three times. So Listen, usually it's I, I don't city. want to discuss uh, <laughs> the probables. That's, well, 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 that's not a good conversation to have right now. Well, the best predictor of the future sometimes yeah, is, we, well, is history. So usually that money's sitting hurricanes there. hurricanes either. We, anything yeah. that could come up. It's basically. not just but, hurricanes. But like the really. pipes at the at the chambers right now, perhaps that could come out of there. But that's not a million dollar. I mean, that's that's not a that type of item. So anyhow, I think that it would be, um, no, it'd still be very conservative in that manner. How would you feel about if we, instead of having two to $3 million, we had the percentage equivalent of that so that it would fluctuate with our fund balance? It would be fine. Uh, like I say, I just want to point out that right now, 5 million based on what we had ended 2021 would have been more than the three million we're looking at. Oh, yeah. Well, if we're going to leave 17 for the minimum unrestricted, I can't. You couldn't do my five to seven percent. That would. That's why I had to reduce the. No, right. it's, it's give and take. But if we left it at 17 percent, and then if we just change it, it wouldn't be five to seven percent on the emergency. But if we brought it down to two or three, maybe two to three percent, two to four percent, that would be more conservative and still okay. achieve the goal. At, okay. at least I, I would be happy with that if council's happy with that. At but least that way, I see it changes with time. Are you still saying 10 to 12 for the minimum? Though? No, we'll, we will go if we go with the two months okay. for the minimum, but then we but we just adjust the two to three from a nominal number to a percentage is what I'm asking, okay. essentially. I think is, that, is that with a no, no issues there? I, I can see that working where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The only thing I was just going to throw out, not to throw a wrench in the whole conversation here, <laughs> but, you know, um, from a where we're at today moment in time, I think from a staff standpoint, we'd be very happy with just the 17 moving forward. If you wanted to revisit this, like say we go through the next budget cycle, we're looking at where we're at at the end of this fiscal year. If things go according to plan, we should have you know additional funding in there. We certainly revisit it in the future, um, but if we can get to consensus tonight, I think you know we're still in a place where we'd love to have that 17 percent and you know a two to three percent for emergencies is not um, unattainable and it, it is reasonable based on our current situation. So, thank you, ma'am. Councilman Foster. Oh, I'd like to ask the finance director, um, would this affect our rating, our credit rating? As long as we stay, uh, no, as long as we stay. Right now, as you know, we just had credit ratings done for the bond issue. Right. Because we have that minimum 10%, of course, they look at what we, where we actually are, and it's saying, well, you way above it. But when you think about it, we've really set a low bar for ourselves. Because right. Ten percent was established back in 2004 when we had the city manager. The um, fund balance policy was an administ administrative code, and it was established by the city manager at that time in 2004. So we have not changed our minimum fund balance requirement in 17 years. But how, how is our credit rating right now? Yes, for the bond ratings, I think it was double A and double A or triple A. Double A. Okay, so by going to the 17 percent, like you recommend, um, will that affect our credit rating? Will we, we maintain that double A or lower it or increase it or what? As long as we meet what we said, I, I will kind of ask Molly, who is our financial advisor, also with right. the bond ratings for the bond, so she'd probably be able to answer that a little better for me. Rating agencies, Molly Clark, I'm with Public Resources Advisory Group, so okay. 
financial advisor to the city. The rating agencies are aware that the city's existing policy requires a 10% unrestricted fund balance, although the city's practice, you are exceeding that. And the, the rating agencies are giving credit to the city for practices that are actually more rig rigorous than required by the policies. But I do believe that, that adopting a more rigorous policy will show a good faith effort to maintaining those more rigorous practices. And ultimately, we can't say whether that in and of itself would prompt an upgrade. You, you, there are so many different factors that go into your investment rating. Right. This is just one of them. But it would certainly be viewed as a credit positive action. Right, it won't, it won't lower it. But, but we'll be meeting a standard across the country if we go with the, um, the government um, accounting standard board, right? That's the way. Yeah. Absolutely. If you're, I don't know that this is on. If you, the rating agencies would be pleased to see the city adopting a policy which is in conformance with those policies um, uh, recommended by the GFOA. Exactly. And that's, that's my point I'm trying to make, uh, uh, Council. Uh, we should go with a standard um, that is proven across the country and it will maintain our credit rating and we'll be um, in a good uh, financial uh, going forward. So that's, that's my point I was trying to make. Thank you. Yes. Um, Councilman Foster, I, I believe when she said a more vigorous application, uh, you know, over time. Uh, so Councilman Bailey's uh, approach is just that, a bit more vigorous. Go on. Yeah, and, and I don't know, maybe there's something that, uh, I, I know Ms. Uh, McDonald just uh, spoke and the attorney, the idea of having percentage as opposed to the nominal numbers. Do you have any advice on that? Is that, how's that, how has that looked considering sitting in the same you know, pot of money? I think it, it is recognized that it's all ultimately going into the same pot. I would be happy to see the stated unrestricted fund balance uh, follow the GFOA mm -hmm. guidance with the two months or 16 and two thirds percent. And then whether the additional emergency fund is a, a dollar amount or a percentage amount, I think that that's just added financial stability on top of the two months. And I think either way that would be viewed favorably. Okay. All right. Thank you. That, 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 and I'm happy with that. I mean, ultimately, I just want to make sure I don't want us to be accused of going below our fund balance. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. I think sometimes it's harder to draw things back than to add mm -hmm. uh, in the future. So if we have 17, we have to get to that position where we have to go to 15 or lower. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough for that council. I don't think it's going to be this council. I hope not. But I'm always thinking long term whenever I think about mm -hmm. these things too. But right. I, I'm, I've, I've seeded the whole point just so you know for Councilman uh, Mayor, for Councilman Foster, and I, I will seed the 17%. I want that set, as, I want at least 17% set, percent set aside unrestricted either way. But maybe if we do that percentage, um, like I said, no, two to 4% uh, instead of a two to 3 million, make it two to 4%. Mm -hmm. And then um, and I, I'd be happy moving forward and we can review it in the future if everybody's happy with it tonight. Well, the. Mayor, the, the only thing about that uh, emergency fund, you got to have, I mean, 2% might not get us two months. It might get us a month or half a month. I don't know. I don't know what, you know, I'm not accounting for the city, but we need to at least get two months of operating funds for emergency. We do live in Florida. We are, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen six months from now. Um, with the economy, so uh, I want to want the city to be operate can operate two months, and if we're in a crisis, we know we're good for two months, and we need to work it out. So that's that's my minimum. We gotta we gotta have enough. I would like three months to tell you, or six months. Uh, be honest with you, because uh, I don't want to ever be in a financial crisis in this city. So, and I want. Uh, so, but I could live with two months of reserve for emergency. Thank you. And just to also clarify on that point, the policy is that the minimum fund balance would be two months. It certainly doesn't preclude you from having a larger fund balance than that. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. And I believe that has been the city's practice over the past couple or few years is, is it in excess of 16 and two-thirds percent. Yeah, and, and to be clear real quick, if we have two months of emergency, that would be another 17 percent on top of, I don't think that's what you, what Mr. Foster was intending, but I just want to make sure that clarification, make sure that we're on the, we're talking the same thing. Because 17% is minimum unrestricted fund balance, then we have emergency. If the emergency was two months, that'd be another 17%, which is far more than two to three million and far more than what I'm proposing. Like we, we don't have enough money for that. Is there anyone in, on, in the public that wishes to discuss this item for or against? or speak on this item? Seeing none, I'm asking for a motion. Oh, we, yeah, yeah, I have a motion. Let me, we, if I may, okay. I'd like to amend my motion to change the emergency from two to three million to two to four percent. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Um, I, I second it because like Ms. Suzanne said, we can, we can change this back. Correct. Or, you know, um, down the line, so we'll we'll see how it looks this year, maybe next year, um, but we're we're sticking with the GF GFOA's recommendation. I'm fine with I'm good on that, and I'm hearing from our finance director, and um, her, um, I forgot her name, and and the fina financial advisor that they're okay with the two to four percent as well. So they're okay with it. I'm okay with it. Any further discussion? I see. You. Okay, so I'm calling it to a vote. Mayor, All in favor? Mayor, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted were. to go back to one of the things that Councilman Bailey mentioned at the beginning. Um, so the language currently in the resolution related to the city manager's discretion on the use of emergency fund um, procurement, I, I'd just like to probably add a little language change in there that says in accordance with the procurement um, ordinance. Um, so the, the specific sentence is in the resolution under section five, there's an additional sentence that says, the city manager in his or her sole discretion will determine qualified uses of the funds held in the emergency contingency fund on a case-by-case -case basis. And I would just recommend adding in, um, in accordance with the uh, procurement ordinance or something like that that would just defer back to the ordinance and that is all the threshold of emergency expend expenditure authority that the city manager would have up to the 100,000. Um, beyond that, we would, we would come to council anyway, so. You want to continue to amend your motion? Yeah, I'll make another <laughs> amendment to the motion to include adding, um, changing the sentence on page section uh, section five, section. the second to last paragraph, where it states the city manager and his or her sole discretion will determine qualified uses of the funds held in the emergency contingency fund on a case by case basis and subject to the procurement manual. Second. Uh, actually, or Come on. Ordinance. I'm sorry. No, where's, uh, where's Juliet? Should I say ordinance? Ordinance, not manual. Sorry. Okay. Could uh, we? Yes. Can we just bring it back next meeting? Would that no. be okay? okay? It's just as far as if we have at his or her sole discretion, and then we later on have in accordance with the ordinance, it seems to be internally conflicting. Okay. I, I would prefer true. if we want to change this, we just take out at in his or her sole discretion and put in compliance with the procurement ordinance. Right. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's you're good. good with that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, ideally in the end, you're going to bring it before council yeah. if it's over 100,000 anyways, and we're going to hear it in the end, even though it's your discretion of what is emergency and what we should right. be considering. Okay, so that's fine. So I, I, will, I will strike that sentence to say the city manager will determine qualified uses of the funds held in the emergency contingency fund on a case-by-case -case basis subject to the procurement Ordinance. Yes. Okay. Second. Again. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna vote on this. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Ms. Smith, item number two. Resolution 2021-04. A resolution of the City of Palm Bay, Brevard County, Florida, supplementing resolution 2018-63, authorizing the issuance of not exceeding $50 million in aggregate principal amount of City of Palm Bay, Florida General Obligation Bonds, Series 2021, in order to finance roadway improvements. 
making certain other covenants and agreements in connection with the issuance of such bonds, providing certain terms and details of such bonds, authorizing the city manager or the finance director of the city of Palm Bay of the city to publish a summary notice of sale and to receive bids pursuant to a competitive sale of set bonds and award the sale of set bonds to the responsible, responsive bidder or bidders offering the lowest true interest cost to the city, which shall not exceed 5%, authorizing the execution and delivery of set bonds, appointing the paying agent and registrar with respect to set bonds, approving the preparation and use of a summary notice of sale an official notice of sale, a preliminary official statement, and final official statement. Authorizing the electronic dissemination of the preliminary official statement and official statement. Authorizing the execution and delivery of a continuing disclosure certificate, providing for an effective date. Ms. Sherman? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. This is, um, the resolution to um, basically take the next step and draw an additional $50 million, $50 million out of the $150 million road bond um, to issue those bonds to fund, continue to fund the road program. So we've, um, with the, the first draw of $50 million, we have um, essentially covered the year one and year two program. We anticipate later this, this calendar year, uh, sometime around September 2021, that we would be out of money with the current projects in terms of expenditures or thereabouts, and we would then be looking to um, to get the funding to start the uh, the year three and beyond. Um, the timing on doing this process, there's a little bit involved. It takes some months to, to follow through, so we're starting this now um, because the last time we did this, we, f we found we started around January and we didn't actually get the funding until a May-June time frame. That timing is important because if we don't have this process started, then we won't be able to continue our um, our procurement process to know that we have the funding there to go out to bid on, as we fin as we design the next um, projects. We would have to hold on putting those out to bid. So um, all that being said, this is the uh, this is the next step in the uh, road bond program, and it is the request to um, take out the next uh, series of bonds to fund it. And the team is here again to answer questions. Uh, Bill Batten. Bill Batten, 586 Ocean Spray Street Southwest. You explained what I was wondering, why we are, why we are drawing this now, and uh, my one concern was, judging by the history of the past two year, two seat, I'm not gonna say years, I'm gonna do phases, We've, all, we've always been staying under budget, which I think is great. That's a lot less than we've ever anticipated on. It's very impressive. Somebody back there gets recognition for that. I don't know who his name is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my concern with this one was just, just in case something bad did happen and things started going over cost on phase three, that you could, could you draw more if you had to? I'm hoping you never have to. But by this, by this, would you be able to draw more if, if it came down to that situation? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sherman? Uh, yeah, so the, the authority that the, um, the voters gave us was up to $150 million. So we would do another um, issuance of bonds if we needed more funding. We've done it in these $50 million increments just because it made sense with uh, the planning of the program. So. We would do that up to the maximum authority given by the voters. Thank you. Any other cards? Council, what is your pleasure? Make Mo a motion. Who's that? Oh, I thought it was. Oh, right. oh sorry. <laughs> um, motion to approve uh, resolution 2021-04. Second. Who seconded it? Second by Councilman Bailey. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimous. Ms. Smith, item number three. Ordinance 2021-03. An ordinance of the City of Palm Bay, Bavard County, Florida, amending the fiscal year 2021 budget by appropriating and allocating funds 
identified in Exhibit A, consisting of 11 pages and incorporated in its entirety herein. Recognizing that such appropriations must be made pursuant to the Code of Ordinances of the City of Palm Bay, Chapter 35, adopting, ratifying, confirming, and validating the allocations, providing for an effective date. Ms. Sherman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is the first uh, quarterly budget amendment for this fiscal year. Um, as, as you've seen in, in prior uh, budget amendments, there is a reference in um, the vast majority of these uh, changes to revenues or expenditures. There's a, a reference to a, a date where this was previously brought to City Council. Um, I know it's about eight or nine pages, so you know, happy to answer any questions on any of the items that you, you may have. Any questions, Council? No. Any public no. speaker cards? All right. What's your pleasure, Council? Motion approved ordinance 2021-03. First reading. Second. Sorry, first reading. Got it. Is there a second? S se yes, second. Okay. Uh, Councilman Forster seconded. Any discussion? No, I just I just want to really quickly, uh, Mayor, if I may. Yes, sir. I uh, just could come in. I I know that it was started a, a, no some time, but I, I I'm glad that I think our current administration stayed on top of making sure that these large items come before us for authorization prior to we get here, um, so that we're not blindsided by anything big. So I just want to thank staff and and encourage that that to uh, continue. Any further discussion? Hearing, seeing none. Uh, this is, um, I'm calling the question, calling the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Listen, at this time, Council, I'd like to take a five minute recess. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I could have waited a little bit longer.
We are communicating. I, I, love, I love the lines of communications. I love the different perspectives. I'll do it by ten this time. <laughs> Meeting back to order. A mic, Mayor. The mic. Yeah. I'm calling this meeting back to order. We're on item number four in new business. Miss Sherman. Thank you, Mayor. This item and the subsequent three items are all um, uh, proposed changes to the Public Works Department. Um, this particular item is a request to, um, you'll recall in prior uh, council meetings I've discussed with you the additional state shared revenue that we uh, received and actually uh, are recording as part of revenue under the um, uh, first quarter budget amendment that you just approved. So another portion use of that funding that I'm proposing here is the use of $200,000 to increase the mowing of our collector, some of our major collector roads and to increase the frequency so they'd be mowed twice a month, um, as well as uh, to outsource that particular function. The current staff that are uh, mowing those roads and many others in the city would, um, would, move, would continue to mow, and so they would, we would just expand the ability and capacity for the city to cover uh, some of the, uh, the roadways that need a greater level of maintenance. Uh, and I'll bring Frank Watanabe up to answer any questions, if you have them. Thank you. Any questions, Council? Um, it's up. I don't know if Ms. Sherman. I know I had a question regarding. You know, I did the numbers real quick on this. You know, six. This is going full time, four times as much as we would with part time, which means that we could add another part time and be half the cost and actually have more man hours allocated and build redundancy. Was my kind of thoughts, but I understand. I did ask that question. There was kind of a, a staff counter. Do you want to you know maybe present and talk about that a little bit? Frank Watanabe, the Public Works Director and the City Engineer. I believe we we're talking about the uh, the full-time to part-time position we're talking about. Oh, I'm about. sorry. I am ahead of myself. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. I was ahead of myself. I did have questions on this one, but it was okay. it was separate. It was, a, it was a review of the uh, the uh, mowing. I apologize, Mayor. Okay. I, I didn't, we're, sorry I'm off that. balance with the uh, break, I think. So we good? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm good for now. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, this is a... <laughs> that's my apology. Any other any questions from staff? Are there any public comment cards? I'm asking for a motion, Council. Motion to approve contracting for the annual lawn maintenance services in the Public Works Department. Second. No, you second. Okay. Second. Any further discussion? 
Yeah, I, I just I did just want to encourage the on this particular item was one of the comments I had was that you no, know, there's certain times of the year where twice a month is not always necessary to to really be at the level of service we need, and so that we consider that in those times that you no know, maybe there's times where we need to have once a month, but I think that's something that might be able to be addressed through the uh, staff. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Item number five, Ms. Sherman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Since Frank's here, I'll defer to him and let him explain our uh, reorg that brings in a new operations manager position. Uh, thank you, Frank Watanabe, the Public Works Director and the City Engineer. Uh, basically, what we've done is uh, we've reorganized the Public Works and focusing more on our operations. Our operations is, is the largest group of uh, Public Works employees we have, uh, and they're mainly out in the fields taking care of all the maintenance. Uh, and so we've rearranged the organization to have it more split that kind of mirrors what we're doing with the roads and pipes. Uh, it's real critical that we have to take uh, more in-house piping work as the road paving moves forward because the, the stormwater money is going to start shrinking to the point where it's, it's more cost expected to have in-house uh, employees doing the pipe installations. And we've been doing it this last year. And we've been saving uh, a good chunk of money so that we can continue to have more money in the stormwater funds, which keeps declining. Uh, with that sense, we need to focus then to have an operations manager to manage that one group of both the paving, the piping, and that one organization. Then we have another operations manager that just takes, takes care of the mowing and any other, uh, like say, canals, cutbacks, and that type of uh, operations. So those are the two we want to focus on and maintain. And to do that, I'd like to have a hands-on manager handling the pipes and the paving. Currently now, majority of it, I do as much as I can. Uh, but it's been taking a little bit more of a toll on me. So it'd be nice to have a division manager there to be out in the field, taking care of it on a hands-on basis. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, council? Any speaker cards? No, sir. Deputy Mayor? What is your pleasure, council? Oh, sorry. Make a, mo I make a motion. Well, you, you got it. My own? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear myself. I make a motion to approve consideration of utilizing unallocated funds for an operations manager and purchase of a vehicle from Public Works Department for $86,625. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Item five, Ms. Sherman. Thank you, Mayor. I'll defer to Frank. Frank, just have a seat right there. Actually, you got it. Uh, Frank Walton, I'll be the Public Works Director and City Engineer. This person actually is dealing with what we have with issues with the building department and the growth management where we have uh, all this growth right now and all this uh, projects going on. In the engineering department, we also do the uh, driveway permits uh, in terms of for the uh, new uh, homes, single family homes, and, and as well as for residential homes. Uh, with the sudden increase both in the building department and growth management, uh, we're seeing the stress right now within our permitting uh, process. We only have two staff persons doing the permitting. Uh, for example, the typical last year, we were pushing in about 70 uh, permit reviews a month. Currently now we're like 180. And so we're pushing it to the limits so it's, it's, it's to the point where we need to have an additional staff. Uh, right now we're looking at right now to cover ourselves to use some uh, outsourcing using consultant services, but it's better to have the in-house person there just to be there. Uh, we don't see a decline in this right now for the long term. So we were requesting for an additional staff person. Thank you, Frank. Council? Motion to approve utilization of undesignated fund balance for an engineering technician to in the Public Works Department. Second. Second. Any further discussion? I'm calling it. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number seven, Ms. Sherman. Or Frank. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, Frank Watanabe, Public Works Director, City Engineer. Uh, I believe the question we, from uh, Councilmember Bailey was regarding the, the, uh, the part-time to the full-time. Uh, and we, uh, uh, in the overall sense, I understand and agree that overall it would be a lot more cost affordable to have a part-time person because mainly it's the issue is when you start adding on the, the benefits and all those factors increases that cost. Uh, what we're looking at here is just like we, we were talking about these other positions, we would like to have more continuity to have that person there full time, provide that, you know, uh, on staff 
uh, five days a week instead of having a shifting of two different people because when you have shifting of two different people sometimes the training adds more burden onto the current staff. Uh, we may not have continuity with the two people because of the hours and shifting. Uh, we feel stronger that we have the one full-time person there to help do the data entry and the data entry person here is a mixture of all the components we've been talking about. They'll handle some of the permitting assistance, they'll have, help out in some of the uh, safety issues we have and coordinating our safety, coordinate our, our emergency response when we have certain issues of emergencies. It's going to take care of our supplies and all the other factors that ties in both with engineering that deals with the roads and paving, that deals with permitting, that deals with what we're talking about before, as well as some of the operational issues. So this person is a, is a hands-on for all these components uh, and we see it as more of a, a full-time person here than two part-time persons. Any questions, Council? No, he, he, Mr. Watanami was addressing my, my statements about, you know, like I said, uh, the, or my question regarding, you know, we have another part-timer for another 15,000 instead of 45 more for the annual. But I mean, they, they've given a, a response to that. Any public cards? No, sir. public speaker cards on this. Okay, Council, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve uh, position change from public works data entry clerk part time to data entry clerk full time with the utilization of the general fund undesignated fund balance. Second. I'm calling it. Uh, All right. in favor? Aye. Right. Uh, was there discussion? Uh, yeah, yeah, Mayor. I, 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 I was just. I, was I just thought gonna, we had already. Well, we hadn't had okay. a motion to discuss. Okay. Yeah, I just asked a question previously. Okay. I apologize. Um, didn't realize it was going to go quite that fast. But the, I, did, I did just want to say that I think that there was a $30,000 more to have a additional part-time person rather than have a, you know, 15000 The difference in, in total is going to be 30000 We could add another $15,000 um, part-time person doing the same thing for another 25 hours instead of another 15 hours. So it's kind of like we're getting 15 hours, but it's quite costly. I do understand there's some continuity and some some issues as far as spacing, and maybe that's something we need to address in the future. Because I'm still a little bit, I have reservations about this. I will support it and go with what staff is explaining. And I understand that there's continuity with more with larger roles than a part time than two part time people would hold because they want them to hold that continuity over four 40 hour work week. And so I appreciate that, but. Um, I did at least want to express my reservations that this is quite costly going up here and, and that we consider these type of things and you know, whenever we financially look at them in the future. Well, there's a lot of intangibles also, Councilman, when you're trying to have two people do the same job. Uh, the continuity is, is critical sometimes when the mission's at hand. Sure. So I, I understand your reservations and you do have an excellent point. However, there's value in that continuity. Sure. So uh, I'm going to call it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number eight, uh, Councilman Foster. Yes, I want to um, get the council blessing to meet with the city staff on the security of the city, city facilities, i.e. city hall, city council, chambers, and things like that. Um, just the other day, we saw our nation capital got brief. Um, prior to before that, we had a um, active shooter uh, lockdown at City Hall, and that didn't go so well. So I want to meet. I have a background in doing security for the Department of Justice, security surveys, security for uh, federal judges. I have a background of that over 20 years. I would like to um, meet with staff and come up with it, some security measures and changes to make sure our employees are safe. Uh, Mayor. Deputy Mayor Johnson? Um, I just want to defer to um, Mrs. Smith. Is this any issue at all, or are we good, or? If we're saying, you know, getting council's agreement that he will meet with the acting uh, city manager who will uh, then coordinate um, any type of meeting and further uh, with the chief because of course council can Can't, yep. authorize him to go directly to the chief but council can uh, support him contacting the um, acting city manager okay and she will certainly get him in contact with whatever the appropriate um officials underneath her authority are 
Um, my, my questions are right along uh, what Deputy Mayor Johnson is saying, Ms. Um, Ms. Smith. But Councilman Foster, uh, do you have a business, a consulting business that does security consulting in, in th that type of arena? No, no, my business is, is expert witness, uh, not security. Thank you. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm for it then. I was just trying to make, make sure we had clarification, um, but I'm all for it. I, I remember the lockdown. So um, any way we can improve, and um, I appreciate you taking a look at this, but any way we can improve our city and make sure the staff out there are safe, um, let's do it. So I'm fine with it. Yeah, protecting our staff is critical. And I, I, I have had uh, discussions even while this, this lockdown was uh, going on. Um, so that is, that is critical for the safety of our employees in that regard. Councilman Bailey. Yeah, Mayor, um, I guess I wanna make sure, cause this is an agenda item, um, that we have clarity because we do have separation of government here. We are legislative and I don't want to delegate any type of administrative type of duty. I, I think similar in line with what the deputy mayor was asking. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to delegate that duty to any council member. Now, that's because that was going to be my, kind of my question. Is there a policy that you want to bring back for council to consider? Or is there a something that we don't have that we need a budget and you need to bring back to council? I'm fine with that. Everything else, we always have the opportunity to question and comment to, I mean, that's in the charter, we can, we can we can speak to her or even to other people with giving notice to the city manager um, and, and, and question things and, and make advice. I don't think that really requires our permission. I think that if we're going to bring back some policy changes and stuff, I just don't want to see like policy changes moved with one council member without the rest of us being involved because I think that we need to stay in our, our lane in that regard, I guess, as, as a legislative or policy setter. And so I just want to make sure the clarity on that, that if there is something that's going to come from it, um, no, through this, then I, I definitely would want at least to be reported back to here so that we can at least have the opportunity to deliberate if need be, if we choose. Yeah, and, and is, that, is that question for me? Under reports, it could have, this could have sufficed under reports or something to that magnitude is what you're saying? Am well, I understanding the, you? Yeah. yeah, it depends on the intent. If the intent is to, um, you know, to kind of set policy with the, with the city manager, I, would, I guess I would deem that inappropriate if it's to set policy with us and to bring something back with, with the staff and, and the city manager's um, uh, no, review and come back to us to approve a new policy or to approve new budgeting for something, that, I mean, obviously that, that would be fine. As long as, it, I just wanna make sure it comes back through us as, as, a, as, a, as a policy. I don't want, like, okay, we, we tell him then it goes there and we never see it again. That's, yeah. That would be my issue. Um, Councilman Foster, would you like to elaborate a little more? Well, it's, it's my intention to more be a, a advisory to staff and bring it back to council for either budget item or policy. Yes, I, I will bring it back to council. Yeah, so in other words, he, he, if, if I'm hearing Councilman Belly right, it's, we can all give that type of input, but for you to work and, and bring back, um, he, he has no issues with that. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with that. Copy that. Uh, Councilman Felix, would you like uh, to add? I think, I, I think that's a great, you know, it's really forward thinking in terms of whenever we can improve, as uh, Deputy Mayor mentioned. Um, I think it's, it's, it's stepping in the right direction. And, you know, as we all can agree, all staff is our most important asset. So we got to do everything we can to, to make sure they, they are protected. I mean, the police department next door, that doesn't necessarily you know, uh, guarantee anything, you know, some could happen at any given time, so. Yeah, and I've discussed that yeah. uh, privately with Ms. Sherman uh, and, and actually Chief Moya. Uh, those seconds are vital. You, you mentioned uh, uh, an active shooter uh, situation. Those seconds are vital. They're, they're right down the street, but that one minute, that w those, those seconds are critical in equipping our, our uh, employees with additional safety measures and, and even equipping them with the opportunity to protect themselves 
uh, is, is something that uh, I believe we should consider. Uh, do we need a motion to so allow this, Ms. Sherman, or is this discussion just good enough? This, this is fine. I think um, we had talked about this. Uh, I don't know we talked about this, uh, Councilman Foster, but we, um, this is the kind of thing you can also bring up under your individual reports, um, you know, request to, to work with staff on a particular mm -hmm. topic. That's another, you know, good venue for that. Um, but I did want to add, since you gave me the floor for a second, that um, just, and I think I've mentioned this to all of you, but since the incident happened with the lockdown, um, uh, Chief has taken, actually Chief uh, has taken the lead on uh, getting a group of, of our team members together, different departments, start exploring some improvements we can make. So we welcome you know, Councilman Foster to join in that process and, and provide his insights too as we're planning our path forward and happy to bring something back to Council as a result of that with, with your help. So. Outstanding. So yeah. we don't we don't need a motion. That this discussions, uh, you have consensus at this point, uh, Councilman Foster, to okay. move forward. Thank you. And to be clear, Mayor, uh, just to be clear, you know, this doesn't prohibit any other council member who's interested of asking questions and making inquiries. We all have that, that authority. Okay. Copy that, sir. That's well understood. Are we good, Councilman Foster? Yes, we are, sir. Oh, we don't need to vote on this issue. We have consensus. Item number nine, uh, Councilman Foster, you have the floor again. Um, I'm just going to get right to my motion. Uh, we, we have a new year, and we need a new city manager. And my motion I want to put on the floor is to make um, – the acting city manager, the new manager, the new city manager for Palm Bay, and I'd be the one to discuss her co uh, contract. Um, I think she'd been doing a, I make my argument after I get a, if I get a second. I'll second for discussion. I'll let um, I wanna make my, my argument for Suzanne Sherman as city manager for Palm Bay. Um, the last council made her acting city manager. They had the confidence in her. Uh, it was voted by the last council. That's point one. Point two, she's been doing it. She's been doing an excellent job. Um, I sat down with her. I evaluated her resume. Um, I talked some, some of her staff, highly recommend her. Um, I even pulled up a, a Florida Today article dated January 9th, 2019, and it says Susan, Je Susan Sherman has returned from her former post as Palm Bay Deputy City Manager, uh, leaving Satellite Beach after serving a three-year stint. Welcome aboard, Susan Sherman. I mean, Suzanne Sherman, thank you for coming back. City Councilman Harry Santiago said that in the last city council meeting. He also said, you d you've done a wonderful job before, and I know you're going to, you be, you be, I know going to continue to do a wonderful job like you did in the past. That was Councilman Harry Santiago. Um, I agree with him. She's been acting for over um, six months. She has the education, she has the qualification, and I think she has the support of staff. And, and she's a Palm Bay resident. And she started in the, I believe the, was it, it was a utility department, and uh, worked her way up to assistant, to the city manager, a deputy city manager, acting deputy city manager, deputy city manager, now acting city manager. So um, I'm going to stop right there. I think I said enough. I'll let another councilman speak. I'll, I'll, I'll jump. If I can, Mayor, I'll jump in. Um, Carry on, Deputy Mayor John. So, uh, so I was, I was thinking, me personally, I was thinking council needed some more time to consider um, what they wanted to do. But 
um, Councilman Foster jumped on it. Me personally, I, Suzanne Sherman has my utmost um, support, and I've shared that with her multiple times. I thought council, the three new council members may, and I know Councilman Bailey probably thought the same thing, they may, may have needed more time, but I know me personally, I, I support her full heartedly because um, she's, she's a person of great character. I, I pride myself just like the mayor and Councilman Bailey on um, going to City Hall regularly and meeting with staff and everything. And I just see the morale of staff and how they you know, converse with her and back and forth. And I see the body language and tone of voice and the respect is there both ways. And that's big because if we don't have you know, camaraderie amongst our staff, then how can we function as a city? And if we can't function as a city, how can we you know, make sure our residents are good to go and the services are provided? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, Suzanne, Suzanne's been here, but what speaks louder to me, and it's something people might not talk about, is she left, and she left for a good reason, because she saw the city going down a, a road that it shouldn't have gone, but here we are now, and she saw that the city was trying to get back on track, and she was like, you know what, I live in Palm Bay, I want to make a difference, and she came back um, Jan January 2019. So, you know, she saw something she didn't want to be a part of and she removed herself from that situation. And when a better light came to Palm Bay, she wanted to assist with that. So I do appreciate her for her character. Um, interested in hearing from the rest of council, especially uh, primarily newer council like Mayor and uh, Councilman um, Felix. But um, I, thought, I thought council might have needed more time before something like this, but I'm, I'll support it. Thank you. Councilman Felix? Deputy Mayor put me right on the spot. You know. <laughs> no. um, I, I would agree. So uh, let, me, let me start to say uh, I recall um, speaking to, to uh, when, when I first actually got elected, and one of the things I did is is to is really seek out to meet with with uh, department heads and 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 uh, Ms. Sherman herself, and I reminded her how you know our interaction years and years ago as the assistant. Well, she she had some role with the uh, um, utility department, where as you know, somebody that, that that very engaged in my community, and, and it was an issue with one of our resident, that elderly that was just assigned a twenty three hundred dollar water bill. Um, fixed income, at no fault of, of our own, and unfortunately, at the time, our ut utility department didn't what do the necessary take the necessary step to assist our citizen, our taxpayers. So that. That was my first uh, um, interaction with Ms. Uh, Sherman. Um, and I can think back, as I mentioned to her, is at the time the, the, the situation was assigned to her because I was, I was relentless. I wanted to serve, help that particular individual. And she sat with me, take her time, did the necessary, take the necessary step to really help our citizen. And, and I, like I said, that goes back, that goes way back. And at some point, at, at that time, she was not necessarily in, in uh, upper management. And just to say with the level of respect, the, 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 the professionalism um, was there over 10 plus years ago. Um, and even currently, uh, there's a lot to say when you have an organization that had internal issue, um, morale issue you know having a leadership having the right leadership so where people can look up to and, and be be happy and work happy to work for and that that says a lot um i can go on um but i had some particular uh, uh concern and question that uh we had a conversation um just to better understand her leadership level um, oftentimes experience comes to the mix, but experience, as great as experience may be, having the right experience in the wrong mix is useless, can be useless. 
So again, you know, I can go on and on and on. Um, I, I think she's has shown a level of leadership that respectful. Um, I would I would in favor of that of, of um, moving her up to to the permanent position as well. Councilman Bailey. Mayor, I always want to hear what you had to say, but um, I, I know you certainly. I always speak last. <laughs> I know you can reserve the um, as you see fit there, but you know this is a to me this is uncomfortable in the and for two reasons. Let me give you two. First of all, I've been through it through this uh, three times now. Well, yeah, well, kind of. The uh, <laughs> in some ways four times, but um, <laughs> to me. And, and, and I think every one of you guys know this. I've told you guys all before you guys were up here. I mean, I was up here before, you know, all four of you guys, and we had you no know, relationships offside, outside of the sport. Um, even Mr. Foster, whenever he was running in, in eight, or, um, started off running in 18 for this uh, council position and uh, later got out for when the deputy mayor got in. Um, you now, what, what I've always wanted it was a genuine search. And, you know, it's difficult sometimes because – it is not a commentary on the individual that we have in place right now. It is a commentary on the process. And so, so foregoing a search is a little bit concerning to me. The second thing is the way that this came forward. You know, last time, um, you no, know, in 2018, you know, I was uh, ready for a change. We changed leadership in going to start a process then we had an item added and another council member make a motion that but there was no item there was no consideration we're, we're making one of the biggest and probably the most i, I mean i'd argue it's probably one of the most important decisions we make as a, as a body is is our city manager and we're making it with no memo no consideration of where we were going until now and and that's kind of how i felt like it happened last time and and i voted and i voted against that i, I was not i do not agree with that process i think that i think that I, my, my minimum request would be that we wait and put this on the next agenda item and the agenda item will be you know, appointing somebody to negotiate a contract to make her permanent and give us all that time to think of that. And now, and, and just as I tried to have conversations with her, but I didn't want to put her in an uncomfortable position because I don't want her, you know, violating sunshine or, or I, I don't want, you know, it, it would have been easier if I had a motion so that we could have a, a little bit more conversation. Um, obviously, Suzanne and I have no. We I think we have a pretty good feel of each other. We spend many hours on on council weeks talking um, on the phone or meeting in person. So, to me, that'd be my minimum request. Bring this back next meeting. Let's give it that proper um, air of time, and and then then take it from there, so we can really fully consider this. Because I, I just don't like it being a, a a memo or a item added the day before the meeting with no memo. So. Um, and I, I'm going to ask the, the public to speak at, at, uh, at a point, uh, but, but for me, for me, it is critical. It is extremely critical that this vote be unanimous. For many reasons. The first thing I'd like to say is Suzanne Sherman is a servant leader. And what I've observed is not only a high level of morale, but a dedication to the people that work with her, a dedication to the city of Palm Bay, and a level of ethics that's unwavering. That being said, it is critical for this body to be unanimous on this decision. I understand Councilman Bailey uh, for going to search. I understand the previous history of our city. This decision as a unanimous body will give and edify our city manager that ability to move forward. I would, I would uh, open this up to see if there's anyone from the public that wishes to discuss this item. 
Is there anyone that wishes to come forward and discuss or speak on this item? And I guess we'll fill out a speaker card afterwards. Uh, please step forward, sir. Butchel ran 219 Trenton Avenue. Um, I, like Mr. Bailey, have seen this go on and on with city managers. You guys have, oops, excuse me. Let me wipe this thing off. Now I feel better. Um, the, the gentleman brought it up. He wants you to vote on it tonight. He don't want you to be unanimous. He wants you to vote what you feel. If you don't feel it's right, you vote against it. If you feel it's right, you vote for it. She's done an excellent job. Keep her on the job. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Batten. As you were, Bill. <laughs> it's an honor of respect. If you're going to call me chief, it's senior chief. Uh, aye, yeah, aye, senior. Gonna... <laughs> aye, aye, senior chief, chief. Senior chief. If we're going there, okay. <laughs> Bill Batten, 586 Ocean Spray Street, Southwest. I see a pro and a con with this process. The good side or the pro side of it is the fact that you'd, you'd have a decision tonight. You'd be working on a new contract and being, being done with it. The negative side that I see with this is we, the city of Palm Bay paid for a search for a city manager. Partway through that search, they changed the process by which they were going to appoint the city manager, and all of a sudden it went from five prospective individuals to 10 people, maybe more, because I don't remember how many people submitted their resumes to be city manager of Palm Bay. And it was not who the search engine found that was selected. And so me being the person sitting back there, not the person up here making the decision, I'm saying, well, why did we even waste the money for the search if they kind of knew who it was going to be already? But perspective of the residents that I talked with was, did they already know what they were going to do and they just made a dog and pony show for, for the benefits of appearance? And especially since what we're trying to do now is we're trying to say, no, we're going to show you that we're running a tight city. Well, the way you show you're running a tight city is you decide how you're going to do it and that's what you do. And a handwritten note in the bottom of my agenda packet for something added at the last minute, that's not up front showing the public what is happening. It's one more thing, well, how did that happen? Well, it was presented after the fact. Well, that's, it just gives that little taint of bad taste in my mouth. Who you pick, that's entirely up to you. City Manager, Suzanne, Acting City Manager Suzanne Sherman has been over backwards to help me every time I've had a problem. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying if you're going to go for the appearance, make sure the appearance is the best one you can have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak on this item? So um, at this, yes, Councilman Bale. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for indulging me for just a minute and just for for the rest of the council. I, I, I think, I want to be clear, I'm not saying not to pick Ms. Sherman. I think that she would be a quality candidate for city manager. Um, am I entirely you know, on board with the idea of foregoing a search? It, it's difficult for me, it is difficult for me. But I'm not saying not to or that, that I couldn't. And I said this a long time ago, I said this back in Debbie Mayor was there, uh, obviously in the last council, if we move forward the way that we did, it's going to be difficult for the new, new council to do anything but make her make Ms. Sherman the permanent city manager when the time comes. And I understood that. And, and certainly I think that she has you know, earned respect and, and, you know, through this time. And I don't want to you know, disparage any of that. And she knows that, uh, you know, how, knows how I feel. Um, but I, I, I do, I, I have to pause with concern tonight. And it's, it's similar to what Mr. Batten was just saying is that, look, it was just, it was added last minute. It was, it's, there was no memo. There's nothing for this. There was nothing for the public to consider. There can't, you know, our normal processes are off tonight because we're, because right. of, not, not that we did it on purpose, but you know the integrity of this vote will be called into question 
if we do this right now the way that we're doing it right now. And all I'm asking is that the consideration that we bring this at a, a regular council meeting and a full agenda packet with a with a memo and and we we move it from there. I don't think that's asking too much, and that and I think that would be good for the public, and and it will be good for me, and maybe that'll help me give me that time to get there where. Maybe it's not the process that I wanted us to do last year, and obviously I didn't like the way that it went down last year when we moved into this, but give the time to process and get over it and now have a conversation with her knowing where, we're, where the rest of the council is heading. Mayor, can, can I speak? Um, or you want to? Councilman Foster. Um, with, all, with all due respect, Mr. Belly, you know, I said in city council meetings from 2006, 16, and I saw you fire Greg Link at a moment's notice during a holiday. You voted for that. Also, the, not just you, the, the deputy mayor did it too. And Mayor Capote, you all fired Greg, Greg Link just before Thanksgiving. And it was no prior notice. It was a new council, and I made a decision. At the end of the day, the city council, the city attorney, the city clerk, and the city manager, by our charter, works for all five of us. Not the public, they work for us. The city manager, the city attorney, and the city clerk got to answer to every council member on this dais. You know, they work, them three individuals work for us. And we was elected to represent the citizen of Palm Bay. And, and they expect when something go wrong in the city, if they're not calling the mayor first, or, or the, sometimes they, they go right to the city manager. But I've been in city hall and they said, I want to speak to the mayor. I said, well, he's not here. So we, we, we've been entrusted with great responsibility. And the staff doesn't work for us. They work for the city manager. The city manager worked for us. That's in our charter. And we have an individual, our acting city manager right now, Suzanne Sherman, who's Palm Bay proud, as you say, using your, 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 your motto, Palm Bay proud. She lives here in the city. She's been working in the city for over 17 years. She moved her way up throughout different departments. She's got the education. She's got the backing of the staff. She uplift morale when she took over a situation during a pandemic and during a city manager being uh, removed and morale being low. And she came in and she did an excellent job. Why in the world you're gonna go out there and get somebody that don't even live in Palm Bay or Bavar off state of Florida, or, or it'd be a waste of money. I'm not for wasting our, our money. We have someone is doing an excellent job, and we're getting ready to go into budget. But times we look for a search and get someone um, a qualified candidate for city manager. We be in June, July. We we, we need to. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We have an individual that took us pretty much halfway through it, and we just got a few months, I think we'd be over it, and she's, she's done an excellent job. So I just wanna, I just wanna point that out. Um, it's, it's council decision, it's not the public decision, it's council decision. So, Councilman uh, Forster, I think there's a consensus here that agrees that the acting city manager is doing an outstanding job. That the issue is not so much going out, but that uh, afford this an opportunity to bring this back so that we can take a regular vote in our regular council meeting, put it on the agenda with enough time for, for it to be publicly noticed out there so we could cover those bases. But from what I'm hearing, everyone here is in agreement with you. We would, uh, I think what I'm hearing everyone say, or Councilman Bailey say is, Can, let's, let's bring this back. So we're all on board 
but we we would like perhaps to do it to bring it back so that this this body can vote have it on the agenda not as a last minute item and and bring it forth your valid your points are valid uh councilman bailey's points are valid uh, everyone has committed and said that she's doing a spectacular job and and we want to continue to build on that in particular with the morale that you mentioned with the palm bay proud you're you're hitting some really excellent points what what's actually going on is giving them an opportunity let's bring this back at our next meeting and then let's be prepared let's vote on it at that time council uh, deputy mayor johnson i'm gonna jump in because um councilman foster mentioned something and him mentioning it brought back my memory so while i, I agree with mr batten this is last minute and the appearance of it um but he brought up Another vote I had, which was my first vote um, uh, right before Thanksgiving, and that was last minute. But to add to it, from the moment that agenda came out, I'm just being real, my phone had never blown up so much of people trying to call me and bother me and trying to influence me one way or another. <laughs> just being honest, I'm saying this to the public. And my worry about, you know, moot moving this along is outside influences that don't have the best interest in the city trying to influence council or somebody to try to vote one way or another. I already have my, you know, I'm already all on board with Suzanne, but him bringing that up reminds me of that day. That's probably why I'm bald right now because I was under so much stress. <laughs> But um, but but I because I I do understand where Mr. Batten's coming from, Mayor and Councilman Bailey. But I him bringing that up, I remember that I remember that day, and I remember when it came on the agenda. Numbers I have never seen before. I'm like, who, how do they get my number? And I'm like, yeah. So I'm fine with moving forward today, um, because I know she has the best interest in the city, and um, so that's why if it's if it's voted on today, I'll be supporting it. Um, may I give me one second, please? Um, the moment I got sworn in, I got people approaching me for her position. I'm not going to give you no names, but you know them. And I've been approached three times by a different individual that wanted to be the city manager of Palm Bay. And, and if we go another two weeks, I mean, I mean, I might have to go in the witness protection program. It, it just, you know, I don't want to kick the can down the road. We know if we have a consensus that she's the one, just make this, an, you know, annoyed her. And Councilman Foster, um, with all due respect, I, I hear what you're saying, um, and Deputy Mayor Johnson. That's part of the, the process, is the public engaging with us. On everything that we do, the public engaging with us. That, that's part of the process. Um, I understand you're digging your heels in on this. Um, it appears that way. I don't see why there couldn't be an opportunity where we could all vote on this unanimously when we all agree that Ms. Sherman is an outstanding leader for our community. And, and we're just talking about two weeks. And yes, if, if they do call us, uh, we already know the person. We already know what, what's at stake. Um, making a decision when we could have made this decision in two weeks, Suzanne's not going anywhere. Suzanne's doing a spectacular job. I believe that we're better off uh, bringing this forward at our next council meeting. And th those are my thoughts. So I, I, would, I would even uh, say it, it, we're acting as though we're rushing on something when we could make this a decision in two weeks. And there's no, no need for us to rush on it. Um, that, that's where I'm, I'm coming from. 
Uh, Councilman Felix, did you did you have something you wanted to add? I, I don't, Mayor. I, I don't necessarily see us rushing. Um, I mean, again, you 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 repeat it over and over again. We all can agree the level of leadership that 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 she can deliver. You know, she she can do. She has been, and she she will. She can deliver a good job. We have the level of confidence, at least at this point. I mean, uh, even Councilman Bailey, I, I would agree respectfully, speak of her level of, of leadership. Um, so what's what, what what being in discussion is the process um, in which it's being done. It, it's an agenda item. I mean, the result. It's not going to be any different in two weeks. Um, I, I don't see why we should not pull the trigger tonight. Councilman Bailey, I, you know, you and you I, use a, I, I do you use see a, his point as you, well, and and I, I get it. I get the concern. Perception can be sometimes a little, you know, uh, perception may not necessarily might not always be uh, the reality. It could be for some people, but. And and this is an opportunity for these folks to see here as we place confidence into her into her level of leadership. Let her deliver. Listen, I, I understand what you're saying. You use a, a term that I'm quite familiar with when you when you mentioned pulling the trigger. Uh, I'm I'm just saying let's squeeze the trigger. Let's squeeze it. Go on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, let me I mean, let, let me say this. I think you know even even if it was um, even next meeting, it kind of feels soon for me. Of course, I was envisioning us having a process and it's taking you know some months, and, and we've talked about that in the past if we did a search. But the idea that we can consider this at the next meeting and and forgive me, Mr. Sherman. I hope you know I'm not saying this in any type of way to throw you in the bus or anything like that. But I think that was really that that seed was planted in my discussion, trying to figure out what's going on with this item for tonight. And said, you know, and one of the things she said is, look, you know, if something happens that we decide to kick this to the future, is something that can be it's done. I mean, it's nothing in your contract that prevents that. Nothing in the ordinance to do that. We're not up against the wall to to make any final decision right this second tonight. And especially for me, not knowing really exactly where we were going with it. Um, but. Here's the question that I think that all the council members are going to be asked. And if if it was so clear that Ms. Sherman's the one, I think she's a very credible candidate. I think if we did a search, she would be in the running, and I think she should be. You no, know, should should apply would be in the running. I, I've always said that um, that she's a credible candidate. But if everybody's in consensus, everybody else is consensus that she's not just an incredible one; she's a great one. Then why did we add this as agenda item? the day before the meeting? Why wasn't it on there last Friday? Was it, why wasn't it on there before that? Why now? I think that's the question. And I think that putting it on the next agenda allows us all to have, now we're all on, all on the same page. Now we all understand where we're, we're, we're heading. We can have those proper conversations with Ms. Sherman. And, and we, we don't have to answer that question to anybody. It's almost like sometimes, you know, you, know, you work for a congressman mayor. Uh, you understand the congressional side. It's like whenever they vote for a bill, they never even read. You know, and I think that sometimes the public, like, we didn't even get to see it. They, they don't you know. It, it's, it's a difficult situation. That's all I'm asking for. It's difficult for me. Um, to me, I think that the integrity process, can, can we legally vote on it tonight? Absolutely. Is it the same thing as whenever we got rid of Greg Link? No. Everybody knew that I was ready for the city manager to go. The deputy mayor knew before he was elected, hey, that's, uh, it's coming. It's going to come immediately. <laughs> it's coming quickly. It wasn't, there was no, the council members, no, no, no member of that body would have been blindsided by it. Nobody would have been unclear about what does he mean by this, okay? And even, even for the public, you know, and I, I don't think that there was anybody really questioning where, where it was going, but it was something that I felt needed to be done quickly. And there's reasons, and we've seen some of those reasons since then with some of the arrests and so forth. I wanted to get things cleaned up. There were, I had, I, I was acting with urgency for a reason. What's the urgency right this second? And why was there, a, why was it a last minute item? That's, I can't answer those questions. So then it becomes difficult for me to, to answer those. And, and I'm just asking for the time to process. You know, and if we do, if those questions go away and the time to process comes by just putting on the next meeting. Well, I respect those, your comments. Uh, who, Councilman Foster? Um, 
Well, I, I put it on there. I, it's my item. And I put it on there the last minute um, because it's, I think it's a decision that councils need to make. I mean, how long are we going to continue to go without a city manager? A deputy city manager. She's doing two jobs. So, uh, you know, we need to show staff that, I mean, we put the item on the pay raise, the the Christmas Eve off, and that went over pretty well to me. So I think, it, she, you know, her position is not a bill. It's, it's really nothing, I mean, we know, it seemed like everybody in agreement that we should make a city manager, so why wait two weeks What's the what's the time to wait for two weeks? I waited since um, uh, November twenty third when I got sworn in, and I wasn't I wasn't there yet to bring that before the before the council. And I took some time and I and I and I had some conversation with with staff. I met with staff, and I didn't solicit anything. Um, about her position. It was people came to me in the city. Um, and I watched her perform since I've, since I've been running for office. And, uh, you know, I've been watching her since she came back. So I've been engaged, and we all up here have been engaged on her performance. And so are we going to keep pushing this back? We got a new year, we need to go forward with a city manager that we have confidence in. Yes, if we don't get a 5-0 vote, if we get a 3-2 vote or 4-1 four, four, vote, I'm fine with that. But she would know that everybody agreed that she should be our city manager, even if you don't vote for her. No, no calling out from, we're still discussing, sir. Thank you. Please don't call out anymore. All right, Councilman uh, Forster. Apparently, um, whatever Councilman Bailey brought forward is, is not satisfactory to you. Um, in, in my eyes, we're, we're about to call on a vote where um, it, it's not going to be unanimous. You, you asked, why, why not wait? Why, why, not, why execute this now? All he's asking for is an opportunity to move forward in two weeks. Perhaps the discussion of the contract. Perhaps uh, other details that, that would ensue based on um, Ms. Suzanne Sherman being the city manager. Um, it appears that we all do agree that she should be, uh, she's doing an outstanding job. At the same time, this was brought up as a written item, and I understand the, the dismissal of the previous city managers. I get that. Hiring a city manager is, is, a, diff, is a different process. And with that being said, I support... Ms. Sherman, as I said, she is a servant leader, and there are many folks that she's affected or actually blessed others by her presence, her demeanor, and her actions. And so I'm fully on board with that. I'm fully on board with waiting for two, two weeks to get those contract issues in place. However, I, I won't jeopardize the compromise of giving her the confidence that the majority of this council supports her. What you said, it being three to two vote, makes, uh, makes a sense of, yes, it'll pass. However, if it's a 5-0 vote, it assures that we're all on the same page. And, and we're not adding any value to any other, any other council people 
on, on this dais. I've said all along I love to work as a team. I've said all along that uh, collaboration and, and moving forward together is, is critical as an example not only to our fellow citizens but to our staff and, and ev everyone likewise throughout the whole county. And, and that's all Councilman Bailey was asking for. Will, will you reconsider and, and perhaps bring this back for two weeks so we could put it on the agenda item? We could have discussions of, of the contract where you could possibly even uh, be assigned to navigate those issues? Uh, you want me to answer that, sir? Would I reconsider? Yes, sir. Um, no, I'm not going to reconsider, sir, with all due respect. I respect uh, Mr. Bailey's um, opinion. I respect that. Uh, but I don't see the need. I don't want to get in a, a, um, a situation where we keep, where we start pushing things down the road. In other words, my metaphor, kicking the can down the road, when it's obvious that we all want her as the city manager, just make a decision. Uh, and, and that's the way I see it. I, I just don't see um, holding off for two weeks. I want to give the staff the confidence. If it's a 3-2 vote, but the, the two who don't vote for her agree that she should be a city manager, I can live with that. Because if you're voting for the... The, the, if you're disagreeing, because we don't, we need to do it two weeks from now. But you agreeing that she be, that you agreeing that she should be the city manager. But you disagreeing that we should do it at the next council meeting. I can live with that. So um, um, she's, I mean, she's shown that she could do the job, and then she's shown that we don't need to go further. We, the city been without a city manager for over six months during a pandemic. We, we need to move forward. I, I, I don't want to go another day without this. Now, I've thought about it long and hard, and I'm the one that put it on at the last minute. But there's a reason why I did that, because I don't want to make it a political football. I want to make a decision right now. I want to uh, confirm that She's the one, and I would like for my, I agree with you, we should be unanimous, unanimous in our vote. I agree with that, sir, but, um, and I'm asking, I would rather have a 5-0 vote, but the goal is to make her city manager, and that's my goal. Deputy Mayor Johnson? Uh, I was just a <laughs> kind of what Butch was saying, um, we have a motion and we have a second. Um, just call the vote. I'm at Mayor, I do, I do have, I want to wrap up. There's one part, I want to make you know, clear on the, the motion. The motion had two parts. Um, if I may just wrap up real quick. The, you know, the, the issue I have is that we, we can't wait for the vote, but we waited till the last second to put it on the agenda item. If we can wait to put the agenda item, we can wait two weeks for the vote. That's, that's, I just don't, that's hard for me to break from that. It just, just let the public see it. And as far as people calling you, when you tell them no, and, and you, when you, when you handle it the right way, they'll stop calling you, trust me, <laughs> because I, I've been there. And, but they're gonna do that to new people. And following up on that, the second part of the motion, as I understand it, uh, Mayor, and, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, was to uh, also dedicate, uh, to, to appoint Mr. Foster to, uh, work on a, a contract negotiation uh, for Ms. Sherman to be permanent city manager. Again, you know, back to the whole new thing, I, you know, I don't think that a new council member should be the one delegated that authority. Um, I, I've, done, I've been around for the contracts. I've been familiar with the contracts, which is a base for what she has now. Um, you know, I, I think it'd be more appropriate for myself or, or, or even, uh, you know, deputy mayor, if, if we need be, if, if it was up to council, uh, to be the one to negotiate that contract and bring it back. Uh, so there's, so that, I just want to make sure I hit that before we vote on, make sure we clarify it, because there's two parts to this. One is, are we going to move forward a contract? Two is, who's going to, are we going to have a council representative to negotiate? And if so, who it is? And it's combined together. But um, I'm going to have a difficult time voting for the one. But the other thing too is, I just don't think that it, somebody fresh on council should be the one that's that's doing that. Can I? 
Can I say something, Mayor? Because because he invoked he invoked my name. Um, I noticed you've been on council longer than I have, but you don't know my background experience in negotiating contracts. You, you don't have a clue. You never asked me, and you don't have a clue. So uh, I negotiate a lot of contracts. And I think I could give um, a fair negotiation for the city of Palm Bay with Ms. Sherman. Uh, it's not that difficult. Um, much things doesn't, it's not gonna be a, something that's gonna change, but I would give her a fair, a fair negotiation. I'd give the city of Palm Bay a fair negotiation. So um, don't disregard my experience because I sat on this dais for two months. Um, my background experience matter. Thank you. So, Ms. Smith, should it be in two, two motions or is it okay for it to be combined? It would be clear if it were to. Okay. Because, yes, it would be clear if, if you first decided whether you want it to a point and then if you agree to a point, then to move to who's going to negotiate because somebody may agree with part A but not part B. It's kind of like, you know, when I tell you all about answering questions during a deposition, not to answer a compound question. Right, okay. So, um, then I'll, I'll pull my second. Councilman Foster? My, my motion was to make Suzanne Sherman the city manager and I negotiate the contract. So if you, if y'all don't want to vote for that, I'm I'm fine with it. But I'm not gonna. Um, that's the motion. So and I'm I'm in support of both. Test test. There we go. I'm in support of both, but I'm, I'm we also have to lean on the city attorney as well, and that's what I'm hearing from her. So I'm hearing one motion first, and then if it passes, then go on to the next motion. If 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 that's the proper pr protocol. Uh, city Attorney, Ms. Smith? Yes, we have, they are related, but they are two separate things. Okay, so I, I, will, I will listen to my City Attorney and make the motion to um, make Suzanne Sherman the City Manager immediately. And I'll, and I'll second that. We have a motion to make Suzanne Sherman the City Attorney, seconded by Deputy Mayor Johnson. City Manager. Oh, as you were. <laughs> as you were. You already got one of those. <laughs> we have a motion. Oh, God. We have a motion to make uh, the acting city manager, Suzanne Sherman, the city manager. And it was seconded by Deputy Mayor Johnson. Any further discussion? I'm good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes four to one. I'm going to do something a little different, Mayor. I'm going to I'm going to take um, Mr. Bailey advice. I'm going to be nice. I make a motion to have the deputy mayor negotiate Suzanne Sherman contract. He did it before. I allow him to do it again. Deputy Mayor Johnson. Is that is that what you said? You mentioned Councilman yep. Bailey. <laughs> is that is that the motion? I'm yes, yes. The motion is to to allow Deputy Mayor Kenny Johnson to negotiate Suzanne Sherman City Manager contract. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion. I I call. Everyone in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Nay. Nay. Passes three to two. Administrative and legal reports, Ms. Sherman. And, and congratulations, Ms. Sherman. Thank you, Mayor. Well-deserved. Yeah, I, I appreciate the comments, you know. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, a little awkward situation, right, at times, but I, I do appreciate everything you all shared and, you know, hope to continue to serve you and the city uh, to the best of my ability. So I, I thank you for the confidence and we'll 
we'll talk again soon on this topic. Um, the only thing I actually wanted to mention, I, I did share, and we talked about it in the um, earlier uh, item, which was our our uh, financial ratings that came in as a result of the review of our um, financial status. So we, we did receive very positive, uh, stable outlook um, uh, bond ratings uh, from, from both S&P and Fitch. And I just wanted to mention that again for the, for the public's uh, purpose, which was uh, th basically a statement for the world at large that um, we are a good financial risk and that we're making good choices you know, collectively as a city. The other thing I wanted to let you know is we've been you know, talking about our population and the growth in the city, and uh, this, this week I got our monthly report, and we have actually uh, surpassed the 120,000 uh, resident mark as of this week, so, or as of the, the report coming out. So it's, that's a big deal for us. I mean, we've been growing, but you know, 120,000, we're January 2021, starting the year there. It's, it's um, you know, kind of cool, so I figured I'd share, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Smith? Nothing further. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> yes, it is. Public speaking cards. Bush Duran. Then Bill Batten. I'll make mine quick. I don't know about Bill. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Bush Duran. <coughs> Excuse me. 219 Trenton Avenue uh, here in Palm Bay. I want to welcome the new uh, council members. Um, you'll get to know me sooner or later. Um, my call sign in the military was bitching, so that's what I do a lot of. Um, first thing I have for you guys is um, these speeding dump trucks running through our city. Now, you guys went on and on about DeGroote being a, a, a deadly road. These dump trucks make it really hazardous. They're 50, 60,000 pounds of steel running 40, 50, 60 miles an hour because they get paid by the load. Second thing, trash containers. I heard Mr. Bailey mention that earlier. Um, these guys need to practice setting the cans back in the yard and not in the damn road. It's a hazard. And the other thing is, can we opt out of recycling? All they're recycling is paper. Everything else goes in the trash. So if there's a way I can opt out of it, I'd like to do that. And then one other thing that come to me when I was sitting back there, uh, the city had an opioid um, suit going on. Do we have an update status on that? Because I thought nationally they had settled it and that the monies were being distributed to the cities. Um, so I don't know if, where we're at with that. Uh, one other little one. U-turns at these major intersections off of Malabar Road. Example is in front of the, uh, the big service station. I can't think what the name of it is now. There's two of them right next door to each other. There's a YY and then this, this one right next to it. People make that, that U-turn to go back to the gas station. Then they do the same thing at Malabar and Minton. And it just jams everybody up behind them. So that's all the bitches I got for now. But anyhow, thank you guys for running and having the fortitude to sit up there and take the stuff that we're going to bring to you. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sherman, would you like to address any of those comments? I, yeah. Okay, uh, Butch, then I'll, I'll get back to you on the items, uh, you know, follow up with you on some of the details of the speeding, et cetera, but yeah. Mayor, Mayor, may I respond to one of the comments you made real quick? Sure. Regarding recycling, and I did want to make a point. I think, Ms. Sherman, you have an email of issue of them picking up recycling. You now, you're saying it doesn't go to recycling. Uh, issues of people saying that they were using recycling trucks and garbage truck, or garbage, a truck to pick up both garbage and recycling containers together. We did receive one uh, resident complaint via email, I think that was, and so that I haven't gotten the uh, response back from Public Works. I can follow up on that. For okay, you. just because because that, yeah. that makes a direct point to what Mr. Orwin just said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Batten, or Senior Chief <laughs> Bill Batten, 586 <clears throat> Ocean Spray Street Southwest. I have three items in under public comments. One. Uh, this is for you and the city combined. Happy New Year. May it be healthy. May it be wealthy. And may it be safe. Item number two. This worked well for short order. 
But does anybody know when we'd be getting back into the chamber? It's a rough idea. <laughs> I put in extra 10 steps just for this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Item number three. On the police and fire pension board discussion, I didn't have a sheet in so I couldn't discuss it, was you have a little bit of power as a council member than you do as just a citizen. You know that and I know that. So if you, have, if you can utilize your power and your power base, then that's what you should do. Whichever you choose, it's okay. You know, because you're going to have contracts and stuff. You're not sitting on the contract negotiation. It's, that's not what the pension board is doing. But you have more power because you're the ones that have to be the one paying the fines. You're the ones that have to be paying the, the bills. You get a little bit of, let me see what they're really talking about, attitude when you're sitting in the room instead of waiting for somebody else to tell you what they said. Just something to keep on, keep on track with. Okay? With that being said, Population just increased to 120,000. Well, that means you all got a pay raise because you're based on capita of the individuals of the population. <laughs> just got a pay raise. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Any additional cards? <laughs> this meeting is adjourned. Good morning.